I think you're muted, Ian. Sorry, this is the uh, thank you for thank you for uh, letting me know. This is the April 14, 2021, City of Edina Planning Commission. This is our call to order. Uh, as most of us are probably familiar by now, we're conducting the meeting by a video conference uh, to comply with safe, uh, safety and wealth, welfare uh, requirements. And um, there'll be an opportunity. We have two public hearings tonight, two public hearings tonight, and there'll be an opportunity for members of the public to comment later. I will give instructions at those time those meetings occur. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Assistant Planner Olson of the staff to uh, do a roll call. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Alkire? Here. Commissioner Bennett? Here. Commissioner Berube? Here. Commissioner Aikman? Here. Commissioner Miranda? Here. Chair Nemrov. Thank you. And for people that are joining us, I'll let you know that because we're doing this remotely, there'll be a lot of roll votes, many roll votes tonight because um, to comply with law, we have that's the only way we can record how everyone voted. So the next item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. I, I don't know if there are any changes I ask staff or if anyone else has any changes they want to make to the agenda. No changes from staff. If in that case, um, if we can get a motion and a second to approve I, the agenda. I move to approve the agenda as submitted. Second. Ms. Olson, can you do a roll vote, please? Mr. Alkire. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Berube. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Chair Nomo. Thank you. Uh, the next item, item four on our agenda is to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Uh, is that, are there any changes to those minutes? I move to approve the minutes as submitted in the packet. I second. Thank you. Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote for that, please? Thank you. Commissioner Alkire? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Bennett? Aye. Commissioner Bruby? Aye. Commissioner Agnew? Aye. Commissioner Miranda? Aye. Chair Nemro? Aye. Okay, well, that takes us to our public hearings. We have three calendared for the evening. Um, and at, at this time, I believe the first one is a continuation, though. And I guess I would ask staff assistant planner Emily Boddicker if, if there's anything we should be doing on that or if there's anyone else rep representing Emily tonight for the staff. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members of the commission, I can take that one. We had a uh, public notice glitch when we originally sent out notices. Uh, we did catch it, but rather than hold the hearing tonight, um, we re-sent out the notices to make sure everyone is notified in a timely manner. So because of that, we ask that you continue the this item to your April 28th Planning Commission meeting. Do we need a motion and a second to do that? Yes, please. All right. Move Anyone? we postpone till the next meeting. I second. Ms. Olson, can you do a uh, roll vote of the continuance, please? Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Elkire? Aye. Commissioner Bennett? Aye. Commissioner Berube? Aye. Commissioner Agnew? Aye. Commissioner Miranda? Aye. Chair Nemra? Hi. Thank you. So we'll see that one in a couple of weeks. Uh, next is item B2106, a request for reasonable accommodation from the permitted six residents to 10 residents at 6222 Breeburn Circle. I believe Assistant Planner Chris Ocker is presenting for the city. Is that correct, Ms. Ocker? Yes, I am. All and yours. I, thank you. Thank you.
I'm going to be sharing my screen. So chair, members of the planning commission, commission is asked to consider a variance request from the owner of the Geneva Suites located at 6222 Rayburn Circle for reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Amendments Act to increase resident occupancy from the permitted six residents by state statute to 10 residents in a group home facility. Geneva Suites is a housing with services uh, group home that has a housing with certificate uh, from the Minnesota Department of Health offering assisted living services and dementia program through an agreement with a licensed home care provider. Subject property is 27,450 square feet in size and contains the Geneva Suites group home. The care facility was remodeled from a standard single dwelling unit in 2017 for the purposes of operating a group home care facility business and has operated as group home since that remodel. Applicant is proposing to remodel the interior of the six bedroom facility with the addition of four bedrooms proposed in the lower level. So this is the upper level that exists today. There are six bedrooms on the upper level. And what they're proposing is to add an additional four bedrooms in the lower level. The federal act prohibits discrimination related to housing against individuals on a, on a basis of disability. Regarding cities, the act prohibits discriminatory zoning or land use ordinances or decisions. A reasonable accommodation is a change, exception, or adjustment to a rule, policy, practice, or service that may be necessary for a person with a disability to have an equal opportunity to use a dwelling. The variance application process is acting as a vehicle for the Planning Commission this evening to consider the reasonable accommodation. We don't have any other process that would really, um, uh, that the city could do to um, address this application, so we're using the variance application. All of the following questions must be answered in the affirmative in order to grant the reasonable accommodation. The existence of a disability. Do the residents have a physical or mental impairment that substantially impacts a major life activity? And necessity, will the variance request affirmatively enhance the quality of life of a person with a physical or mental impairment? And reasonableness, is the accommodation request reasonable? In determining the reasonableness of the accommodation request, the commission must apply the following criteria. Does the request impose an undue burden or expense on the city? Does the proposed use create a fundamental alteration in the zoning scheme? If the answer to either question is yes, the application is not reasonable and can be denied. Regarding disability, yes, the current and future residents of Geneva qualify as persons with a disability under the definition established by the act. Regarding necessity, six persons with disabilities currently enjoy equal opportunity to use and enjoy the dwelling. So demonstration that an accommodation is necessary requires a showing that the desired accommodation will affirmatively enhance the quality of life of disabled persons by lessening the effects of the disability. The Geneva must show that increasing the resident limit to 10 persons would provide more enjoyment more use, more medical advantage for persons with disabilities. Staff believes the applicant presented insufficient evidence to the city indicating why the increase from six people to 10 is necessary. Applicant presented insufficient evidence to indicate how allowing 10 residents at the location would enhance the quality of life or lessen the effects of the disability in any way that allowing six residents would not. In determining whether the requested accommodation is reasonable, commissioners, should evaluate whether one, it imposes an undue burden or expense on the city or two, creates a fundamental alteration in the zoning scheme. A request will be considered reasonable only if the answers to both of those questions is no. An accommodation is not reasonable if it imposes undue financial and administrative burdens, undue burden or expense, including any specialized burdens on municipal services, but not identified burdens must be significantly more than normal and rise to a clear financial burden on the community. Fundamental alteration of the zoning scheme. 
An accommodation is not reasonable if it requires a substantial and fundamental modica modification of the city's land use and zoning scheme. The city must consider the scope and magnitude of the modification requested and the features of the surrounding neighborhood in order to make a determination. The commission should take into account emergency calls, maintenance or repair of buildings, traffic, parking, garbage and recycling management, and the character of the neighbor are all relevant in this situation. Staff has concerns that the added number of residents to the home would increase the high volume of traffic flow and reliance on on-street parking and would alter the zoning scheme. Parking currently occurs on the existing residential driveway and within the street when needed. The city's customary home occupation ordinance states that all parking demands generated by the customary home occupation shall be accommodated within an accessory garage or normal driveway area. As indicated in the parking plan, cars stack within the driveway in three rows. If nothing is available within the driveway, residents, staff, visitors, maintenance crew, and delivery drivers will park in the street. Cars within the driveway could easily be boxed in by other cars and not be able to get out of the driveway as easily. There were some sh photos shared with the city uh, recently showing some of the conditions that occur uh, nearby and on the site in terms of parking. An increase to 10 residents within the home will have an increased demand on the on-site parking flow and parking and increase on-street parking, altering the character of the neighborhood and creating more of the appearance of a commercial medical operation when a, within a residential zone. If the decision is made to grant the accommodation, reasonable terms and conditions designed to improve the use may be imposed, provided they meet the general nexus and proportionality requirements. Whether the commission recommends granting the accommodation or denying the accommodation, findings and conclusions must be made on the record to ensure that a reviewing court may determine whether the decision is reasonable. Staff recommends that the commission deny the request and variance to allow the increase from six to 10 residents in the existing group home facility at 6222 Brayburn Circle based on the following findings. According to the Fair Housing Amendments Act, it is unlawful to refuse to make a reasonable accommodation when such an accommodation is necessary to afford disabled persons equal opportunity use and enjoy and enjoy a dwelling the issues of whether this group home should be allowed to operate in its current location whether the group home provides valuable resource to the community and whether the group home affirmatively enhances the quality of life of disabled persons by lessening the effects of their disabilities is not a dispute the city acknowledges and supports the fact that the group home provides a valuable resource to the community and enhances the quality of life of disabled persons. The sole question is whether an increase in residents from six to 10 is reasonable and necessary under the Fair Housing Amendments Act. Proposed accommodation to increase occupancy from six to 10 residents is not reasonable because it would fundamentally alter the zoning scheme due to the change in neighborhood character. Namely, the increase in volume of parking and traffic will alter the essential residential character of the neighborhood. The proposed accommodation to increase occupancy from six to 10 residents is not shown to be necessary under the applicable legal standard because there are not sufficient showing that increasing the limit of 10 persons is necessary to provide additional enjoyment, benefit, or use of the resident for disabled persons. Section 36-1254A5 of the city's customary home occupation ordinance states that all parking demands generated by these shall be accommodated within the accessory garage and normal driveway area. As indicated on the parking plans, cars stack within the driveway in three rows if nothing is available, residents, staff, visitors, maintenance crew, and delivery drivers will park in the street. The increase to 10 residents within the home will have an increased demand on traffic flow and on-site parking and increased street parking, altering the essential character of the neighborhood and creating more of an appearance of commercial medical operation within a residential zoning district. With that, I will stop and answer any questions you, that you have. Um, I should note that Dave Kendall, the city attorney, is present for questions, as is David Fisher, the chief building commissioner. Thank you, Ms. Ocker. Do any uh, members of the planning commission have questions for Ms. Ocker? Uh, I have a question. Okay, uh, Commissioner Alkire. 
Um, yes, the, I'm, I'd like to be crystal clear on the state statutes. It was helpful that they were sent out today. Uh, and my understanding from the state statutes is statutes is that six or fewer residents is permissible in a single family home zoned area, but that more than six is not. Did I read that correctly? And what does that tell us about the discretion we have as a planning commission to do something different? That is correct. Um, currently we have, I think 16 um, resident um, group homes that have six residents. We may have some that have few, um, fewer than four that we might not be aware of that um, the health department doesn't isn't required to license, um, but beyond six, um, we don't. Ha they're not permitted. We don't have a conditional use permit um, that would allow for that. It's um, limited by state statute. We do have Dave Kendall, our city attorney. He might be able to help out with some of your questions on that. Commissioner Alkire, um, to answer your question. That is the presumption of the state statute, but the commission is still required to go through the analysis regarding reasonable accommodation. The presumption of the under the state statute is not controlling. That's not the end of the analysis. If it's possible for the city to make a reasonable accommodation, the city is still required to do that despite the, the state statute. So uh, you can't simply rest on the fact that the presumption of the state statute is that six is permissible in a single family district and seven to 14 is permissible in a multifamily district. If you find that it's reasonable to permit more than six in a single family district, you still have to consider that. Okay, thank you. Planner Ocker, um, I have a clarifying question as well. So in, in what you mentioned and also in the materials, there are three questions that we need to address. One is um, the existence of a disability. The second is the necessity of the variance. And the third is the reasonableness. So if I understand correctly, there's no dispute about the existence of a disability. We're not looking at that. We, we agree on there's disability. Um, there, there also, are, are we looking at necessity as well as reasonableness or are we only looking at reasonableness? Well, you can look at all three, but I think everybody agrees that, um, you know, the, the first one, um, absolutely, um, but the other two you would be able to consider. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Well, I have a question for Mr. Fisher. You you provided an interesting memo. I'm wondering if you could kind of give us an overview on that. What 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 you're saying in your memo? It seemed to it seemed to even get into why we're here tonight. Well, so the zoning code and the building code look at things differently, as you all probably know. And um, so, from my perspective. Um, this would be an if you go from if there's three or six occupants, it's considered R three under the building code, which is a residential residential home, and that's what it was built as, and that's what it is today. If they have six people, once you go to seven people, it kicks it in because people have dementia in this one. It it turns it into an I two, which is an institutional occupancy, which. You could put it there, I mean, it's fine, but it would then, uh, it changes it for the building code. I mean, it could be in a residential neighborhood, but there's a lot of things that have to happen in the building code when that happens. Um, and I kind of went through my memo, it said, you know, it has to be sprinklered with a full blown NFPA 13 system. So not a 13D, which what is there today, which is a domestic water system. And then uh, type of construction changes from type, type five, non-rated construction to type 5a which is one hour construction throughout that means they got to have one hour construction throughout the house and then the accessibility issue um if they have to exit from the level of discharge so this, this is a walkout on the bottom as well as the top so they could make it work but again it has to be accessibility i think that's five percent all the way out to the public way 
that means they're going to need probably put some switchbacks in and ramps in and stuff like that too so there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen on the building code side if they change this occupancy to an i2 and that was not what i or what we thought and we issued a building permit uh november 11th we didn't have any idea they were trying to change the occupancy we we, we didn't get a uh, code analysis or anything when they submitted so this was reviewed by a residential uh building inspector so we have a lot of homes that people remodel and put elevators in here too and it's not that they couldn't you know put rooms in to get them ready for the future and still have six people too they could still do that it's just they can't they can't have more than six people if they have more than six then it just it creates something different for me too there's a change in use for me and, and they would need a a new certificate of occupancy for that so i hope that answers your question yes thank you very much mr fisher i have a follow-up question for you and perhaps staff do any of these changes particularly you mentioned some possible re possibly required external changes do any of those could any of those changes affect the character issue related to the neighborhood um well for the for the construction type you can you can whoever the architect is would have to provide the documentation that's necessary to verify what the a one hour assembly is for that wall um they i believe they could do that inside by adding a layer of gyp inside throughout the house that's a there's a possible way of doing that um on the exterior if they had to add switchbacks and ramps and stuff in the yard it could create uh it would look different um they would have to provide a handicapped parking stall for sure within the driveway um it's it's a commercial use for me so it changes a few things so that means they need a handicapped parking stall and a an aisle space for handy for somebody to park next to it so right now they don't have that Hmm. It's not required in a single-family home. Yeah, and that that could actually reduce the total amount of parking. Then, couldn't it? It, it? it could. Commissioner Bartling, it looked like you, you were about to say something. Yeah, I know I, you probably have some expertise here. Yeah, and not just an, a note on on David's too is the the gyps the easy part. There's there'll be the sprinkler system and the dampers and everything required are going to be the more difficult. Um, and quite expensive, really, but that's not our problem. But nonetheless, to get that up to code, um, I think it would be pretty extensive, right. just so that everyone's aware of that. Commissioner Ocker, do you have any thoughts on the, the character aspect of those external changes? Well, some of not them would change. For... Pardon me? Some of the changes would certainly be you, you could see them, um, the ramping system, if it's required, the, it would it would lend a more commercial look in a residential zone. Any other questions for staff members by the commissioners? Any other commissioners? Commissioner Alkire. Just a very quick follow up for Mr. Fisher. Can you say just a few words about what one hour construction means? Well, so a regular single family home doesn't really have any ratings within the walls except the separation between the house and the garage. There's a 20 minute separation. It's it's a it's if it's a one hour separation, you have to find a UL assembly that meets that criteria. Um, Typically, you can gain that with two layers of gyp, one on each side, five ace type X gypsum on. That's one assembly that could work. Um, typically, the studs are 16 on center, insulated. So that's you, you have to go to a gyp manual and find that assembly that it could work. If that helps. Are we are we talking fire rating? Is that what yeah? It's gonna... a fire fire rating. Yes. Okay. Yes, that helps. Thank you. Commissioner Bruby, did you? Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? Or... We'll, we'll have more opportunity as a commission to ask questions too, but uh, I guess if, if there aren't any more at this time, I'd like to invite the applicant to come up and um, give you the opportunity to make, your pre make a presentation and I'm sure we might have some questions for you.
So welcome. Uh, who's speaking on behalf of the applicant? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Bill Griffith representing the applicant. There are uh, three other speakers who are part of the presentation this evening. So I will begin um, at various points in the presentation. I will hand it off to others who are on the line uh, and then I'll sum up. Uh, Mr. Chair and commissioners, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening in this hearing. I understand it's a bit unusual to have a reasonable accommodation request under federal law come through your variance process. I believe your staff has given you a good outline of the requirements of the law and the findings that you need to make. Uh, I will point out that the, the reasonable accommodation that's requested is um, under zoning and it is not um, a building code issue that you're wrestling with this evening. I appreciate that the building officials have provided background to you. Um, the, the applications that are before you are for all internal improvements. Uh, today, it's speculation whether something will change on the outside of the building. Uh, what's been submitted so far to the city, both in building plans and now under this reasonable uh, accommodation request are for interior improvements. Uh, we provided a code analysis. We have architects involved and, and in order to have a certificate of occupancy, they will meet all building and fire code standards um, that have been addressed. So we wanna focus um, on the issues that staff has outlined as required for approval. Um, we're going to address, uh, we will not address the disabilities because that has been essentially stipulated to in the staff report and by the comments of your staff and uh, planner. Uh, so we will address necessity. We will address the reasonableness of the requests, particularly in terms of parking, parking management, and uh, calls for service. Uh, to do that, it will require that I um, uh, call up uh, through the chair, of course, you're running the meeting, but I will name the, the speakers and then you can uh, call them to the, uh, uh, to the commission. So uh, before I do that, I just wanna reiterate uh, because this is a federal law, and I think uh, Mr. Kendall gave you good advice in terms of the, uh, the federal law taking precedence over the state statute in terms of the findings. If you can accommodate these users, if you can accommodate these renovations, and they really are to serve four individuals who are under contract to move into this house. Keep in mind that renovations were underway, uh, renovations uh, with building plans showing four bedrooms, were underway um, when the work was stopped and, and the, this process um, was started. And so there are four individuals uh, with needs to be in this house, this house in particular, because of its proximity to where they live now, uh, the services that they enjoy, and the, the fact that three of them are actually family members, and we'll get into that. And so the federal law really says to us as uh, residents, as uh, individuals, and as, as local government that if you can't accommodate these this request you should do that because they have a right to live in a residential neighborhood like you and me so that's the the fundamental operation of the law um, the the question of necessity is really driven by the fact that there are very few places to accommodate individuals in the community within a residential setting and we will address the reasonable reasonableness of that request based upon staffing levels parking, parking management, and emergency services calls. So with that, um, Scott Hemingway um, is the president and founder of the Geneva Suites. He will address the first couple of questions on, on your agenda in terms of the findings. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Hemingway. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Bill, and, and uh, commissioners and staff. We appreciate your time this evening. Um, please indulge me for a couple of minutes here. Uh, true story. So we received a call from a daughter who appeared to be very anxious and stressed out because her father was living in a facility where he wasn't receiving much attention by the staff because he was so belligerent. As we talked, I discovered that the staff of that facility moved her father down to a room at the end of the hallway so they wouldn't have to quote unquote deal with him as much. Well, of course, this was a rabbit hole because he just became more and more belligerent because he wasn't receiving much attention. So prior to him moving into the Geneva Suites, we found out that he's an artist and loves painting. This was actually taken away from him at the previous facility. When Tom, of course that's not his real name, 
moved in. We had an easel, painting board, and paint set up for him, just waiting to be used by Tom. When he arrived and walked into his room, the look in his face was memorable, to say the least. His smile was a mile wide. Now he had a purpose again. His room was the first room down the hallway, so he could get all the attention he wanted. Interesting, our staff never found him to be belligerent. Actually, quite the opposite. Later on, his daughter said to us, thank you. I got my father back. The point of the story, we love caring for people. This is why we do what we do. It's our primary core value. My wife and I started the Geneva Suites journey about six years ago with a vision to create a place for an ordinary person with disabilities to live out their life with purpose and dignity. The concept was simple. Combine all the positive attributes of a large facility with in-home care into an actual home environment where a few residents can thrive and feel appreciated together. To achieve our goals, I'm proud to say we set some new standards. I'll share a few of them, but please know there are many more. We created an option, and by the way, no one was doing this, an option for our residents to receive strength and balance exercises from our very own licensed physical therapist at no extra charge. As you can imagine, the benefits are substantial. The residents have better functionality and families are so appreciative. Next, we want to make sure our residents receive the attention they need when they need it. Unlike large facilities where a patient may wait up to 30 to 45 minutes for a staff to respond. We accomplish this by tightening staff to resident ratios based on the needs of the residents. So unlike the national one staff to 12 residents ratio in large facilities, our ratios oftentimes are as low as one to three. And for this reasons, this reason, we've had eight residents since inception who came on to us on hospice and subsequently actually graduated off of hospice because their life has improved due to the staffing ratios and all the attention they receive. That's what happens when people feel appreciated. Lastly, we invested in a chef to create all the meals so that our caregivers can spend more time caring for our residents rather than spending all their time in the kitchen. By the way, our residents love the meals, something that most large facilities struggle with. This is not a transactional business for us. It's a calling. This is why we continue to receive referrals from past resident families and numerous social workers, especially during the pandemic. Our care model is now the preferred model of care because of what we accomplished during COVID. I'm happy to share no outbreaks in our homes. I'm so proud of our dedicated staff, but we don't have enough rooms. We keep receiving referrals each week and unfortunately have to turn them away. I do wanna make a quick comment though regarding what the neighbors wrote under the section, Other Concerns, Part 1. In six years, Geneva Suites had one substantiated complaint, only one. This resulted in zero fines and no licensing issues. Was thoroughly reviewed, adjustment and corrections were made internally and no other substantiated complaints since, or before for that matter. All other dates listed are either unsubstantiated or inconclusive, meaning for the record, nothing came of it. The Department of Health reviews all allegations, no matter the intent. Anyone at any time can complain to the Department of Health for whatever reason they desire. This leads to numerous unsubstantiated and inconclusive complaints for any organization licensed with the Department of Health. We have a very solid record that I'd compare all day long to assisted livings and nursing homes. We're making a difference in people's lives. We're passionately transforming healthcare into human care. I am hopeful that those in decision making positions understand the severe need for good, caring housing for people with disabilities. People who have disabilities, their choices on where they live are not infinite, they are finite in nature. We are a small organization that provides some hope for good people who struggle with hope and struggle with finding appropriate places to live. These are real struggles for real people who live with disabilities, people who need others to care for them. We have a home they can call home in the city they want to live in, Edina, Minnesota. And by the way, some of those Geneva Suites residents actually have been Edina residents all their lives. Let's give people with disabilities, those who are truly dependent on others to live, the same 
as those of us unafflicted by the disability. I think we can be better together in Edina. I'll leave you with this. I received a beautiful letter from a sister of one of our residents. I think it's a very reasonable depiction of who we are and why we do what we do in someone else's words. Last month, I received a note from Deb. It said, hello, Scott, my name is Deb, and I am the sister and POA of your new resident named Dean. I wanted to let you know how very happy we are with your staff and services. I want to especially compliment Camille and Amber for helping Dean transition and adjust to his new home. They have been so efficient, super responsive, concerned, and professional, exclamation point. This is Dean's fifth move since I brought him back from a nursing home in Arizona two years ago after his bad rollover car accident. He is only 59 years old and has been, this has been very difficult for him and my mother of 79 years and for me. Dean has never been married or had kids. I'm his only sibling. He has been in three large healthcare facilities, three hospitals, and this is his second small 24 seven care home. No other facilities seem to be willing to accept Dean and give him a chance like Geneva Suites. Camille and Saadi were very thorough from the very beginning with taking me, his case manager, and his past group home RN. They understood that a lot of his frustrations and behaviors were due to his last home's environment, lack of understanding there, as well as the home not being wheelchair accessible. Dean was placed there during the beginning of COVID last April and in a rush to get him out of the hospital in Fairball. That move was horrible and very chaotic for Dean. This move was so smooth and so well planned. Camille worked really closely with me, the case manager and your team to make this happen. We are so grateful for that and for the lovely new home with patient and caring staff. Amber, the nurse has already seen Dean a few times. She has helped us with getting Dean on a couple Zoom calls with his psychiatrist and case manager and me. That was very helpful. She cut his hair the first week and was there, which made him feel so much better. Amber is also helping him to see Carol the uh, physical therapist and to get other healthcare providers set up. I also wanna compliment the care partners that we have met at the home. They seem very responsive, friendly and caring. It is not an easy job, but they do it well. Dean is really enjoying his meals and his new room with a lovely view, large TV, his own bathroom and shower and recliner. We love that he has a call button and wears it. He never had one at, a, at the last home and that was a problem. He seems to get shaved often and doesn't look scruffy like before. We are anxious to be able to visit with him on that nice deck. No one in the past two years has been so helpful and resourceful in the things that Dean and I need to make his life a little bit more easy. We are very grateful for this and for your wonderful staff. I have worked with a lot of healthcare professionals over the past two years and Dean, to many specialists myself, I can't tell you how much your staff has helped me to have less stress in caring for Dean. I am truly grateful. My compliments to you for hiring such wonderful staff and for running such a great company in lovely homes with warm regards. Deb. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I'm happy to answer questions. Mr. Hemingway and Mr. Griffith, are there any, is there any other, before we start asking questions of you, I just want to confirm whether does do uh, the Geneva Suites have any other portions of presentation you'd like to make tonight? Yes, we have two more speakers and then I'll wrap up, Mr. Chair. So um, we'll try and keep this moving along, but it's important to demonstrate necessity and the quality of care for the residents, both the residents that exist there today and reside there today and those that are prospective residents under contract. So the next speaker, uh, Mr. Chair, is Rebecca Reich, she's an LPN and a guardian and conservator. She's working with a family of three who are under contract to move into the Brayburn house. Um, I believe she's available for the for, uh, brief comments. Welcome, Ms. Wright. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so I was asked to uh, join this evening. Um, I am the owner of Guardian and Conservator Services and we provide different fiduciary services to individuals. One of our duties is to try to help our clients with housing and also with 
acting as a trustee, which is the case here, um, and working with the family. So uh, the family of three is the uh, are the individuals that I represent, and uh, it is our goal to try to keep them all together. We uh, have been working with Geneva Suites since, gosh, a good part of last year. And in October of last year, uh, put a down payment, a, a reservation fee, I guess, uh, to reserve three rooms. We did um, three rooms at Geneva Suites. And, and um, we understood that it had not been built yet and that they were in the process of um, making those plans and we were willing, or the family was willing to wait. Um, the family that uh, we've been working with has been looking at many different other options for living and one of the challenges is that in a typical assisted living building, they would have to be in separate rooms, um, parents in one room and the person that we represent in another room, and that's not how they want to live. They want to be able to live together under the same roof, within the same proximity of each other, as the parents are incredibly hands-on um, with their son and dedicated to um, his care and providing some uh, services for him. And the parents are also aging and at a point where they need the assisted living services as well. And Geneva Suites um, was able to not only keep them together, but work with us to keep them together and um, build an area that was going to meet their needs so they could stay together under one roof all within a couple rooms of each other and um, our one client needs 24-hour care and the parents are needing some services themselves. Um, we are hopeful that the plan will continue to go forward because the challenge like I said has been trying to find another location where they can all be together in close proximity. Um, so we have also other clients at other Geneva Suites locations, and we've been very happy with the care. If we've ever had an issue, we just let them know and they address it right away. Um, but overall, I think the care has been great, and uh, we liked the Dyna location for this one particular family because uh, I'm trying to be careful not to give out too much medical information here, uh, but it's close to all of um, the activities that the family participates in and um, close to all the medical providers that they currently see. And also um, this family has two, um, two other sisters who live in the city of Edina. Um, one might be St. Louis Park. It's right by 136th Street, or 36, yeah, 36th Street, right by Excelsior Boulevard. Um, but uh, they both live within, they would live within about less than 10 minutes from their family. And that would make it really beneficial for, um, a family I'm working with to move to Geneva Suites so that they could all see each other a little more um, often than maybe they normally would. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Ms. Reich. And then um, is, we'll hold questions for the applicant. So I believe there's one other speaker also on behalf of the applicant. Yes, and, and then I have uh, comments, as I said. So Great. Matt Hanley is going to address uh, operations, staffing, and parking management. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I believe this is Scott. Um, I believe Matt is still trying to get on um, on the call here. 
uh, if he's uh, not able to speak at this moment, I can run through a few more of my comments and, and we'll try and uh, get him back on for testimony, if that'd be acceptable, Mr. Chair. Although, you know, once we close with the applicant, if he, didn't, if he doesn't make it in time, maybe somebody else could pinch hit for him because we'll, we'll close the applicant's testimony then and then we'll go to community comments. Yeah, I would just ask staff who's in charge of the uh, WebEx if they see Matt Hanley trying to join the the uh, meeting. Um, yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Mr. Chair, it's it's important to note under the topic of necessity not only uh, the the comments about the quality of care, which is germane, but also the demand for this service, this housing arrangement with services in residential areas. Um, so, of all of the Geneva Suites facilities, which I believe includes. Um, 40 units, 95% of those are occupied. In Edina, since the facility opened, it's 100% occupied. The longest vacancy is 30 days as residents transition um, from one uh, facility to another or one opportunity for another. So essentially, the Edina location has been 100% occupied, which goes to the issue of uh, demand and necessity. And then you heard the comments regarding the quality of care and the unique arrangements that are made, uh, such as accommodating the family that uh, Rebecca Reich um, represents. I would also note that there is a letter in the record from Ms. Reich, um, which is also corroborated by the family member uh, John uh, Ritchie. I can give his name because he disclosed his name as part of the public record. Uh, they basically corroborate what has been said by, on their behalf by Rebecca Reich. Um, so it's, it's important to understand that there is a strong demand, a demand that is not currently met um, in this facility or other facilities. Um, and I would just ask if uh, Mr. Matt Hanley has been able to join the meeting. Um, thank you. This is staff member Liz Olson. I am resending him the invitation now. Hopefully he's able to get on. Okay, well, I'll continue my comments and uh, hopefully he'll be able to connect. Um, so, Mr. Mr. Chair, is it okay for me to continue? Sure, if you have more to share, that, that's great. Right, it's important uh, testimony because this is the record, obviously, that's made at the Planning Commission and, and the hearing process. So we'll continue with our, our prepared testimony. So the um, the issues that have been raised uh, by the both the city staff and uh, neighbors uh, focus primarily on parking issues and calls for service. So I'm gonna address each of those in turn. Um, the, the chief of police has noted that there have not been any calls related to parking for almost two years since June of 2019. The records reflect that. Uh, Mr. Hanley was going to testify uh, that at that time, they've always had a parking management plan and that's been submitted as part of the record. Uh, but that parking management plan and the enforcement of that management plan is, uh, was stepped up approximately two years ago in response to neighbors' concerns. I would note that none of those uh, concerns, those calls for police service result in, resulted in citations. So obviously the, the police and, and whoever handles your prosecutions did not uh, see that there was a, a violation um, and, and did not uh, impose penalties as a result of those calls. Uh, needless to say, um, the result of those calls was an increase in enforcement of the parking management plan and a um, response that, uh, that we believe is very favorable. The pictures that um, were included in the record because uh, there's, a, there's a flag outside and, and that flag has not been outside for almost those two years. So those pictures are quite old. So reference to the pictures and congestion are not uh, current pictures and we don't believe accu accurately reflect the current state of parking. Uh, now, I, I did note that Mr. Hanley has joined and so if, if uh, he could provide testimony at this point, he's responsible for operations. So I think it's important to hear from the, the person who is directly responsible for operations. The operations people report to him as CFO. Hanley. I thought I saw him. Oh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? You're on. Uh, okay. I apologize to the commission. I've been listening the whole meeting, but for some reason I could not find the link. So sorry about that. 
Thank you for helping me out on that, Liz. Um, so they've asked me, I've been asked to speak tonight to the commission a little bit about two of the primary issues related to the staff's objection. Um, one is parking. Um, we're fortunate with the Brayburn property to have a very wide parking lot. Um, actually, you can park four cars wide and three cars deep. So we've given a, with this submission, we gave a diagram of three cars wide because we felt that was more reasonable. And uh, so we think that we have flexibility there to, to get all the parking we need. Uh, what goes hand in hand with that is that staffing uh, related to the increase from six to 10. I've been through this as the CFO with my director of operations and my director of nursing and specific to the cares of the people who are gonna be living there. And we believe, um, frankly, the people at Brayburn are some of our highest cares, uh, that we can take care of staffing um, simply by taking, is if you look at the submission we gave you, our fourth staff member, and rather than having them come and go, come in the morning early, leave, and then come in the afternoon and leave, if they just come in the morning and stay all day, we can take care of the cares that we need, the extra care load with the extra the extra people. So the staffing will actually just be increased extra staffing versus, uh, you know, bits and pieces. So we're really not taking our staffing from above four at any time. We have a nurse there um, during the majority of the day, as well as up to three care partners. And we have two care partners at night. So we believe with those up to four cars, we have room for at least another two cars, which is typical of what we have for visitors. So we typically have one to two guests at a time at any point during the week, as well as another full lane for any deliveries. We have our deliveries for food twice a week on a regimented schedule and supplies at the same time. So we don't anticipate more traffic. In fact, hard to believe as it might be, there would be less because that fourth care partner would be, rather than coming and going twice, just coming once and leaving once. Mr. Hanley. And then Mr. Griffith, did you have anything further? Yes, I do. I have uh, quite a few comments to wrap up, but I will um, move it along. So uh, Mr. Hanley addressed the staffing, which essentially does not increase today. They have four staff members at a peak. Uh, usually it's less, uh, three care providers, and a nurse. And so that staffing level will essentially not change. Uh, staff will be there for more hours of the day, uh, but there will not be an increase in staff. And so there's not truly an increase in parking demand. The deliveries are delivered three times a week. Uh, food is delivered along with other supplies at, uh, during the same delivery. It's in the afternoon um, to be at a time when uh, there's not a lot of traffic on the road. Um, so that doesn't change. Uh, the parking management plan is the same management plan that I just addressed and that we submitted to the city staff. Uh, both Mr. Hanley and Mr. Hemingway have stated to me and, and would state this to the planning commission, neighbors, and the city council that they are always willing to look at that issue if there are additional conditions that the city thinks is appropriate to ensure that parking complies with the city code. Um, they're willing to do that. I would note, of course, that uh, the Edina regulations, uh, while the, the use of the house should be, um, you know, the usual use and customary use of the house, uh, uh, parking demand should be accommodated in the driveway and the garage. Um, parking is allowed on the street. Um, it's legally allowed on the street. The police chief noted that in his comments on this application. And so just like other residents uh, of the community, who would occasionally have visitors park in the street or they might have a step van pull up to deliver um, UPS or FedEx. That's a completely legal use of the city street. Uh, what needs to be accommodated in the, in the parking pad and in the garage is the usual and customary demand created by the house itself. So an occasional visitor, an occasional delivery, uh, that can occur in the adjacent street and the, and the police department has confirmed that. But nonetheless, um, the, uh, the Geneva Suites will continue to be a good neighbor and is, is open to the city's um, conditions related to parking management. But bottom line is, if you're not increasing the staff, uh, you're not, uh, these, the, the people moving in have mobility constraints and don't own cars. 
And so the really only the demand that's created by the addition of four new residents is the, the visitors. Visitors today are about uh, average about one to two visitors a day during the weekday and two to three visitors on uh, per day on weekends. And so the addition of four new visitors might increase that slightly, but not over um, not over the capacity of either the driveway or the adjacent street to accommodate visitors. So the last thing that I want to address is the calls for service. And um, that is the, uh, of the, the reported calls to the site, that is the most significant uh, number. And it's been 25 over, uh, just over three years of operations at this location. So the average is six to seven uh, per year or an average of one per resident. Now that's important because that, that plays out over all of the Geneva Suites facilities. Six to seven per year, approximately one uh, per year per resident. Um, now that is a service, an emergency medical service. It's, it's not a police call. It's obviously dispatched and it's provided by emergency, emergency medical services. In response to inquiries, both your uh, assistant fire chief and your police chief said that those services, th that increase in service could be accommodated uh, without any problem. They didn't cite any problems. The, um, the assistant fire chief noted that if the congestion that's in the photos uh, continues to occur, that could be a problem. But the point we're making about those photos is they are approximately two years old. They do not show a current condition and that there have, there have not been parking complaints regarding congestion for almost two years. So it's our understanding and belief that the implementation and enforcement of the parking management plan has resolved that issue. If there remains a concern, uh, again, we're willing for uh, a discussion of reasonable conditions that would um, address parking and parking management. So if, if we're saying ultimately, I'm just gonna kind of wrap this up now with a summary of of what we've addressed. If we're saying that we're not adding staff, and, and that is correct, Mr. Hanley addressed that. If we're saying that the residents who have mobility constraints are not bringing cars to the site, and that is correct. And if we're saying that the calls for service average six to seven per year, our proposition here, and I believe it's borne out in this testimony, is that this does not create a financial burden or undue burden on the city. That has been borne out by your own chief of police and your assistant fire chief. Um, addressing the deliveries, we've, we've addressed those. It's three deliveries a week. That's not going to change. So there's not an increased demand for deliveries. All of the deliveries uh, for the additional residents can be accommodated in those three deliveries a week. Um, and so basically, we've addressed parking. We've addressed emergency medical services. Um, so the calls for services which um, are dispatched through EMS have been addressed. The city has offered no evidence that that creates a burden on the city. We've addressed the parking issues which have uh, largely been resolved over the last, uh, for more than two years, um, or I should say since June of 2019. So this is a residential home that offers uh, quality services to the disabled, four of whom are under contract uh, to move in here when the renovations are completed. And we believe under federal law that, that we have met the burden and the, and the requirement for showing that the city should grant a reasonable accommodation for those residents to live here. Now, I would note that um, I've, I've been uh, appearing before the commission and the city council for, for all of my career, which is over 30 years. And it's been heartening to note that the city of Edina in recent years has um, expanded housing opportunities in, in the community. And they've stated a goal to accommodate a variety of residents in a variety of settings. And, and I think that's laudable. This is one of those opportunities to really show that, that that's a, a true intent of the community. We believe that uh, this, this residence can continue to be a good neighbor. We believe that the accommodation of four new residents will not place an undue burden on the city. And we believe under that showing that federal law actually requires the reasonable accommodation. We thank you for your time this evening, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, so before we go to a public hearing portion, I'd like to ask if any commissioners have questions for the applicant. Commissioner Berube, it appears you can go first. I, I do. Thank you. Um, 
uh, Commissioner Nemiroff. Um, Ms. Wright, thank you for your comments. They're helpful. Um, you've got a, the perspective of a professional in the industry. Um, of course, you've got clients who are interested in living here, but aside from that, you don't have a vested interest in this, we're assuming. Um, can you tell me, does your area, your geographic area of clients that you work with, is it is it primarily the Twin Cities? Is it primarily Edina? Is it is it outside Minnesota? Can you give us a little bit more color? We serve the entire state of Minnesota. We have clients, we have probably about 70 clients right now. And okay. um, I think our farthest away client is in Hubbard County. And, in Minnesota. Uh, in Minnesota, correct. It's about three hours away from here. Uh, we've had a client that had resided temporarily in Wisconsin, and then we also deal with out-of-state, um, not necessarily clients, but usually property issues as well for some of so, our clients. A follow-up question for you. When you're working with clients in their current setting or you're trying to find a setting for them, a, a good living situation, are you looking primarily at homes similar to Geneva Suites, you know, smaller home type settings, or do you also look at more, um, I hesitate to use the word institutional, but, you know, non-home settings that might have many more people? Sure. We have a variety of settings um, that our clients reside. Some live independently in the community and receive services in their own home or apartment. Um, or condo, and we have others that are in residential care facilities, and then we have others that are in uh, assisted living buildings, and then we have some that are in nursing homes. So of the ones that are in residential settings, are, do any of those settings have more than six residences? We have, yep, we have had um, clients at Gianna Homes, which is in Minnetonka. I believe they have 11 residents. Uh, we have, I, I, I mean, it's hard to think right off the top of my head which other facilities. Uh, residential, they're usually limited to uh, under 10 for the most part that we've come across. And um, so for the most part, I would say probably seven is average that we see. Well, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that. And then um, if you don't mind, Chair Nemirov, if I ask Mr. Hemingway a few questions. Hemingway? No, please please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to let you know, my, my uh, mom was in a, a setting similar to what you described, Geneva Suites, and it was a fantastic setting for her. So I, I really applaud this type of setting. You know, a residential setting can be really superb for some situations. Um, and I think it's important that as a community, we support that. And regardless of the disability, whether it's cognitive impairment or um, any other type of disability, it's important that we have diversity in our communities. Um, I, a question for you, though. Um, I understand you've got facilities to an Edina and then some outside of Edina. Is that correct? Yes, Commissioner, it is. And how many residents are in those other facilities that you have? Uh, right now, each uh, home has six residents. And why do they have six residents? Um, when we first started out, um, we looked at staffing ratios and we decided on uh, six. There are some places that have more, some places that have less. But we we're when we first started out, we wanted a one to three staffing ratio, and that was important to us uh, because we wanted to make sure that the residents were cared for. Um, 
we think <laughs> better than most other places. And so that's that's really the main reason there isn't there wasn't any any special formula behind it. So so just just so to make sure that I understood you, I it, so your other facilities do have more than six. No, ours do not. Okay, so every other facility you have has six. That's correct. And how many facilities do you have? We have a total of seven. Okay, and and why did you choose this one to have more than six? Well, this home has, it's kind of unique um, in the sense that the, the footprint and the size of the home um, is conducive to more rooms. Um, up until this point, we really, the, the lower level of this house um, hasn't been used much and um, it's unfortunate. And so um, the other homes, there might be one other home that has uh, potential for utilizing um, another level, but um, but this home is, uh, as you've probably seen in some of the paperwork, it's uh, it's a nice size. Uh, the driveway is a nice size, and um, it's it's conducive to having uh, extra room. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I I. I <laughs> uh, I want to ask if other commissioners have questions. First, I want to tell you that I just got a notice on my computer saying my 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 WebEx app may update during the course of this meeting. So if I get kicked off, I would ask that uh, vice chair or staff or someone uh, take over until I return. But uh, do other commission any other commissioners have questions for the applicant? I'm still here. Well, I have a few, so um, I'm not sure who should answer if it's Mr. Griffith or Mr. Hemingway. Um, but uh, it seems that what one one of the core requests you're making is to say that um, an increase of residents from six to ten people would be reasonable. And I, I guess the, the the first question I have is it sounds like that currently you have three or four staff people on site already, if that's, is that correct? Um, so I can answer that. So the, yes, um, the short answer is yes. Um, what Matt Hanley was referring to earlier is that um, the fourth person uh, actually comes and goes. And so they're there for a very short period of time in the morning and then again in the afternoon. So there's actually more traffic now versus when having 10 people, that person would actually be there all day long. Other And other people come and go. I mean, I assume the chef comes and goes also and physical therapist. Um, so that's a great question. Um, the chef actually works out of our commercial kitchen in Bloomington and the chef prepares the meals and then we have somebody that delivers the meals twice a week along with uh, any supplies. So there would not be any additional uh, travel per se um, from our staff. And is physical therapy, is that one of the three people that's currently counted in your on-site staff? They already go out there. Um, there would not be any additional travel for the physical therapist. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one way I'm looking at this is I'm trying to understand. I mean, it really is, it seems like it's a it's a property that generally houses nine or ten people as opposed to six 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 residents and three or four staff, and and at the delta of four it takes it to thirteen or fourteen people using the facility. Generally, is that is that a fair way to look at it? Or um, so you're. You're referring to total people in the home at one time? Yeah. Yes. Correct. Okay. What, and obviously you're saying that 10 residents would be reasonable. I mean, could, why, why do you consider 10 to be a reasonable number of residents? So this concept is, um, is something that is nationwide. And there are many organizations out there that actually have more than 
more than 10 people. We do not want to create an environment that feels like a facility. And the home that we have uh, doesn't feel like it, it doesn't look like it, it doesn't smell like it. With the modifications that we need to make, it's not going to change that feel. Um, we believe that going to a larger model creates more of a facility feel. And in this particular home, we happen to have a home, as I was mentioning to um, uh, before, we have a home that can accommodate this many people and in a, in a very respectful way. And quite frankly, there's, uh, there's not a lot of homes out there that can do that. And the need is so great that it feels like the right thing to do. Are you familiar, you know, I, 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 for better or worse, I spent a significant amount of time looking at uh, assisted living facilities, adult rehab, nursing homes, um, memory care facilities. Um, are you familiar with the Rock Mahome in St. Paul? A little bit. Um, I know of them. I don't know a lot about them. Okay, because like they have ten residents, and I'm wondering if if there's something different about that facility. Um, I don't know that there's much difference there. Their their operations, I'm sure, are slightly different. Um, but they are not the only other residential home that has um, uh, more than six residents. Um, okay. There's another one in Mendota Heights that has more than six residents. So there are a number of homes around the state that have more than six residents. Why, um, what, what, is there a number that, I mean, in the application, it seemed like one of the things you were basing on was the number of family members that could live in a house. Is that, is that applicable or is that not applicable? Mm, that might be more of a question for Bill. <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't necessarily have a right or a wrong answer for you on that one. My apologies. That's okay. Mr. Mr. Griffiths, if you'd like to answer. I just I'm stepped sorry. out. Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question? I just stepped out because um, I needed to get some information that I wanted to testify to, but uh, could you ask the question again? Sure. And that's the, um, how, how, in the in, in the in the applicant narrative, it seemed like part of the basis was based on the number of people that could live in a single family home. And I'm wondering how that applies. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and commissioners, the the case law, and I don't want to get too into the weeds um, because you've got legal counsel here, and and uh, but the case law basically says. If you can accommodate, I'm saying this in a, in a lay statement, if you can accommodate the residents within a single family home setting, then you should be able to do that. And so all of the questions that you've been discussing this evening, I think are germane. And that's why we've emphasized the, the management of parking, the management of deliveries, the lack of an increase in staffing, the lack of an increase in deliveries, because those are the type of impacts. Uh, the reason I stepped out is because uh, my wife and I uh, lived on Virginia Street in St. Paul in a residential neighborhood next to a larger home about this size. It's, it's an old Victorian. Our family lived next to it for 19 years, the Amy Johnson house. And they had something like 12 or 13 residents. Uh, they had parking for staff in a similar configuration off the street. Um, and, and we lived next door to them. And I usually don't testify as to my own personal experience because I don't think it's germane, but it is germane here in that, that homes in the teens um, with staff um, around the clock can be good neighbors. Uh, my children, uh, five of them grew up next door, no fence. Uh, our swing was on the property line and I did not have a concern for my children's safety. Um, in all of those 19 years. And I only bring that up because I think the commission is struggling to say, what is the right number? The right number is really dictated by what can be accommodated uh, while still being a good neighbor. And, and that's really why we've testified tonight to the, the nature of the emergency calls, the nature of the parking, the nature of the staffing, the, the fact that it's not increasing. Um, we believe that we have been a good neighbor 
And we believe we'll continue to be a good neighbor. When I say we, I mean the Geneva Suites, of course. Um, and, and I think, that, you know, the commission is doing a good job of kind of drilling down into those issues and trying to understand how that can work. But I don't think, I don't think there's a magic number that is six or eight or 10 that really decides that it's, it's what the property can accommodate uh, and, and managing its own impacts. And this is a large property. You've seen the, the overview photos. It has a large parking area and all of the improvements to, that have been submitted to date are within the house. Now, again, if there are code issues that we need to address, we'll do that as, as part of the code review. But from a zoning code standpoint, everything that's been proposed to date is within the interior of the structure. Well, a couple divergent follow up on that. One is every time we get a variance, uh, you know, it sounds like you do have to change the structure. And, and it feels like what you're asking for us, you know, generally when we do get a variance, we look at the whole structure, interior and exterior. And it sounds like the building department is going to require changes to the ex outside. And so I almost feel like it's hard for us to, you're saying we should not consider the outside, but whenever we do get a variance, we almost always do consider the outside and the impact that has on the neighborhood. And am I misunderstanding? Because it feels like you're saying that we should not consider that we should be different from our normal course. Mr. Chair and commissioners, um, the, the comments that I heard this evening, I heard for the first time. And so it's a little difficult for us to respond to something that has, has not been addressed. We provided a code analysis from a competent code, uh, an architect with competency in, in fire and building code. Um, and so the the applications that have made been made to the city to date, uh, are both building and zoning call for improvements to the interior. There's been no request for improvements to the exterior. And the, the comments about switchbacks and whatnot at this point are speculation until we can address them from a a building code standpoint. So there's no definitive statement that those requirements are are needed. Um, if there is a, a need for a um, uh, parking space that's that's designated, that can be done um, with very little change to the property. So again, you know, it's it's a little hard for us to respond to something that was raised as a matter of speculation this evening. I mean, was it raised? It was raised by the city's building department. Who, who who learn they you know I understand that you're learning things for the first time but it's not like the billing department learned things only when they went to visit what had been provided so it feels like you're asking us to approve a variance for something that isn't permissible to be built at this time according to our city and 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 usually usually that issue in my experience I'm not the expert on this but usually the issue of whether something can be built is subject to you know if it can get a variance usually that's decided first before the variance is decided and then it's decided whether or not it can get the plans are buildable i don't know i i, I would ask you mr griffith and perhaps our staff and our city attorney if any of you if, I, if i'm seeing this wrong i'm i'm not a land use guru um so i defer sure. to everyone else's expertise sure i appreciate the question mr chair I'll, i will address it from my expertise and then you've got uh Council for the city on the line. The request that we're making is for a reasonable accommodation based upon your zoning code limitation of six persons or fewer in the house. So it is a, it's a request under zoning. Um, if, if that request is approved, uh, we will continue on with the building renovations and we will be required to meet any applicable building code um, and fire code. Uh, but that is not, in, in my view, that's not in front of you this evening. You're not deciding whether or not the fire code applies. Um, you're not to, you're not deciding whether uh, certain changes have to be made to the to the exterior. What what in my my view you're deciding is whether we can accommodate within this house uh, up to ten residents uh, served with services. If we have to come back and and amend our applications to make it exterior improvements and if those are not allowed under the zoning code uh, it's likely we'll be back in front of you but, but my understanding of the question that's before you is whether your zoning code can be altered through this variance process to create a reasonable accommodation under zoning to go from six to ten but it seems kind of speculative because we don't have a buildable plan to review 
I disagree with that. I, I disagree with the statement from the standpoint that we have we have submitted the building plans. Um, the the planning commission is not charged with reviewing our building plans. That's the the role of the staff. No, not at all. I agree with that. But right. but but we generally don't opine whether a variance is permitted or enough until we have something that's been approved to be built subject to the variance. And we cannot move forward in this hearing as we are this evening until we submit uh, materials as we did to the zoning department, to the planning department that meet the requirement for this process. And the city staff, uh, Mr. Um, Kerry Teague is on the line, confirmed that after we provided some follow-up information that the application was complete and could move forward through this process. So again, we're, we're asking a question under your zoning code. If you resolve that, we will go through the process to meet your building code and your fire code. That will be separate and apart from this, this hearing. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, let me just- Mr. Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me just add on to that. Uh, I, I think that's largely a, a correct Summary, I would just add, uh, you know, from what Mr. Fisher talked about earlier, uh, it sounds like there may have to be some modifications or some adjustments to the building code. And I think the, the commission can take into it. If, if Mr. Fisher says that something definitely must happen, the commission could take into account what an impact that might have on the neighborhood character. So, you know, he talked about, I think a fire sprinkler system definitely would have, have to happen. I, I think he sounded less certain about whether, you know, the ramp, wraparound ramps or the handicapped parking space would definitely have to happen under building code. But whatever he's certain must happen, I think you could take into account its impact on the character of the neighborhood. Um, but Mr. Griffith is correct that you do have to um, move forward basis based on the application as it is before you here today with the understanding that they will be required, whatever the, the building code requirements and fire code requirements turn out to be, they will be required to comply with those. And then I have one completely different question, and, and that is, have, has the applicant had a chance to meet with neighbors about and discuss the plans with them? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, the we have not met with neighbors to discuss the plans um we certainly as expressed this evening by the owner of the company are interested in talking to neighbors about uh parking management uh which has been the primary concern raised um and so if if that becomes a requirement of this approval process uh and and even if it doesn't um the the owners are certainly willing to meet with neighbors to talk about parking issues. I would again point out that uh, there have not been complaints for almost two years. And so it is our belief coming into this hearing that they've been largely addressed over the last two years. I would suggest that if you do, you should talk about more than parking because it seems like there's some neighborhood relationship issues too that might be benefit from a discussion. Um, that's not required, of course. Um, any other commissioners with further, any further questions? Otherwise, this is a public hearing. We'll open it up unless anyone else has any other questions. Okay, so for people that are watching online, this is the opportunity for public to give testimony of up to three minutes. We ask that you try not to be duplicative. We have received feedback from people. Um, I received, by the way, one feedback uh, an email directly to me, which I believe was shared with the entire planning commission this evening, but it was also, I believe, duplicative of something that was sent to the public file. Um, if there's anyone who is, who would like to make, give testimony tonight, what you should do is call 1-800-374-0221, enter conference ID 9628828, press star one, and then you'll be connected with an operator from the city staff. And you'll, as I said, you'll have up to three minutes. We're gonna put you into a queue. And we, you know, again, we ask you to you know, try not to share something that's already been shared. Um, and we'll let you know when you're approaching or have completed the three minutes. So with that, I guess I'll turn it over to, to our city's AV team and communications team.
Thank you, uh, Chair Nemiro, members of the commission. We do have quite a number of callers tonight. Uh, already, we do have one person in the queue. Um, obviously, we do expect more as the delay hits. Uh, so the first person that we have in the queue is uh, Lindsay Berg. So operator, please unmute the line of Lindsay Berg. Welcome, Hello. Ms. Berg. If you, if you could give us your uh, name and address, that would be great. Welcome. Sure. I live at 6230 Brayburn Circle, so just a few houses down on the same side of the street. Um, and my name, like I said, is Lindsay Berg. Um, so one of, there's a few different things. You know, lots of neighbors have been talking ever since we found this out. Um, I'd like to note I'm a little bit farther down, so I can't speak as much to the parking issue. I personally, and what the people on my part of the street want to talk about more, since um, there are people up the block too on the cul-de-sac that also have young kids, but I have an almost four-year-old. There are several other children at our end of the street. Um, and it's instead of parking for us, since I said we don't really see that, um, there is an unbelievable amount of traffic. And um, I would like to ask Scott personally, um, you know, he's talking about the different deliveries in situations like that. What he didn't take into account or didn't talk about at all is the pharmacy deliveries. Um, my son plays outside all the time. We're outside all the time. I, my, uh, I sit in my office, which faces the street. Um, I sometimes see within an hour, three pharmacy cars go by. Um, I see them all the time. We see people coming and going from there all day and really all evening. And one thing that the neighborhood really would love to know is, you know, he's talking about three staff all the time with that fourth person who comes and goes. But from our experience, especially in the middle of the night, there are people coming and going all the time. Um, I'm not a very good sleeper and my bedroom window faces the street. Um, I can see our street and Gleason and we're just constantly seeing people coming and going. Um, I don't know if there's a turnover in the middle of the night in that 12 to 2.30 a.m. Um, range, but we would love to know that and why there is so much traffic heading up there in the middle of the night. Ms. Berg, we'll collect you all comments and then we'll try to return to them at the end of the public testimony. Uh, are there okay, other thank members? You so thank you. Are there other members of the public that would like to testify? Chair Nemirov, at this moment, there are no others in queue. There are still several callers on the line. So if we can want to give them a moment or two to catch up, um, again, star one to enter the queue and we will uh, give them a moment or so, um, yeah, I have 829 right now. Okay, we do have one more in the queue, um, several. We'll start with, uh, if the operator can unmute the line of Rose Norman, please. Hello. Hello, everybody. So uh, my name's Rose Norman. I live at 6208 Brayburn Circle. I'm about five houses down um, from the facility at the top of our cul-de-sac. So I'm calling as a concerned citizen and mother regarding this facility. Uh, to give you some background on myself, I have lived in Edina for 16 years. My husband and his family have resided in Edina for three generations, and we have lived on Brayburn for three and a half years. We have two children and I have two small dogs. So this uh, 6222 Brayburn, uh, what we found is it's been extreme, extremely disruptive and it has had a huge impact on uh, the integrity of our neighborhood. Uh, we purchased this property with the expectation that it would be a quiet cul-de-sac situated in a family-oriented neighborhood. And we quickly found out this was not the case due to this facility at the top of our, cult, of our street. Uh, and this is due to the high volume of traffic coming 
to and from the facility at all hours of the day and night. Many of these drivers have no regard for speed or stop signs, and it's completely disrespectful. I also want to highlight on June 23rd of 2019, I was walking my small dog down Gleason Avenue and was run off the sidewalk by a reckless driver who was affiliated with this facility. Uh, I did report this to the police, uh, so they are fully aware. And I also want to highlight that we have a high volume of, uh, I don't know if they're staff or visitors that will park outside of our home. Uh, they smoke, they change cars. Um, some of them actually will park in front of our home in the winter time when it snows because they can't get up the steep hill. Uh, and this happens, um, it, we've actually called the cops on multiple occasions because of this. So again, I just wanna reinforce uh, my concern over this facility. Again, it has been very disruptive uh, and it has had a significant impact on the character of this neighborhood. And um, quite frankly, I'm appalled the city has allowed a business such as this to operate in our neighborhood. And I just wanna note also, if Edina wants young families to expand and invest on the west side of Edina, they will turn down this request to expand uh, this facility. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Norman. Are there other people in, in the queue? We do have several uh, now in the queue. The next caller, if the operator can unmute the line of uh, Shelly, and I apologize, I do not want to attempt the last name, P-S-Y-H-O-G-I-O-S. Uh, yes, it's, it's Sahoya. Hello? Welcome. Uh, yes, if I, I think I heard you right, Ms. Sahoyas, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, Welcome to I, the Planning Commission. Um, I would like to thank you so much. I would like to address a couple of concerns about the calls for service. I believe Mr. Griffin said that they have um, an average of six, uh, six per year. Um, so where our home is strategically located, we're one home away from uh, Geneva Suites. We are five homes away from English Rose, which is on Lockmore, and then Caddy Corner to the English Rose number one, there's English Rose number two. So um, because of the traffic and the calls for service, I went to the city hall and uh, made an application for calls for service for both Geneva Suites and for English Rose. And I'm not sure what Mr. Griffin is talking about because I have the calls for service in my hands for um, Geneva Suites on Braeburn Circle. And just since January 1st of 2021, there has been 11 police and emergency visits, and a couple of them are rather alarming. On the 3rd of um, 329, March 29th, there was a theft at 1 o'clock in the morning that the police came to. On 327, there was a dis in disturbance. I don't know if it was an internal disturbance, a disturbance in the street. I'm not sure. And then I could actually go, on, go down the list. But... The number he gave was not accurate because I have the calls for service right here in my hand. So just this year, we have 11. Um, now, if you look at the overall pictures of the call for service for English Rose, in the last three years, Geneva Suites has had 56 calls for service. 27 of them have been not medical related. Um, English Rose, uh, the one on Valley View, in the same time period that they have had 56, English Rose has had 20. Calls for service for them have been non-emergency. The English Rose on Lockmore has had 42 calls for service. Only two of them have been not, have been not emergency. So I'm not sure where they're getting their information because I have the Adina Police Report right in my hand. My concern is it really is a, a burden. Um, a year ago, um, and the true picture is when they say they talk about the parking, is there, we are looking at a little different situation here because of COVID. Because of COVID, there has been no meetings and hardly, there has not been visitors allowed. So that is not an accurate perspective. And I need to make a correction to the Edina police report. Uh, four weeks ago, I called the Edina police and I think it was officer Hernandez came there because I called because there was 40, not 40, excuse me, there were the 
the driveway was full and there was a total of 30 cars parked in the cul-de-sac. And the officer came, we had a discussion. He said, I'm very sorry. He said, I went in there and talked to the uh, owners or what was going on in the home. And he said that they will be gone in 20 minutes. So I, there is, it's not a complete report because I am the one that made the phone call to the police and I am the one that went up there and counted the cars. Um, Pardon the interruption. That happened, I um, staff is just letting you know you're at three minutes. Okay, so am I done now or can I say one more thing? I'm done. Am I done? Karen Nemrov, you're on mute. I am on mute. Uh, Ms. Ohayas, thank you. If you could just wrap up quickly, we'll let you have a few, few just another few seconds. Hello? I believe we, we may have uh, lost her on the call. Yeah. So thank, um, thank you. Our, our, our next caller is uh, from is Tom Smith. So if the operator can please unmute the line, Tom Smith, and uh, he will give testimony. Hi, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Smith, and uh, and Shelly is my wife, by the way, and I live at 6228 Brayburn Circle, uh, which is a single-family residence. Um, I have concerns you know, uh, about this home up there, about the proposed increase in the number of residents. Uh, so it's two, ten residents. Um, we are a cul-de-sac with limited parking. It has uh, been very, very, very busy. And with the number of cars, trucks, and vans that have been going back and forth, there really is a traffic issue. And uh, um, it, it's a, it's a cul-de-sac. It's one way in and one way out. So it, it is. We have a number of uh, um, young people, young kids, and dogs, people walk their dogs. We don't, this is a cul de sac and we don't have sidewalks, that type of thing. And we constantly have to be looking, you know, for the, uh, the cars, trucks, and vans that are continually coming uh, up our street and back. Uh, certainly is a traffic issue. Uh, I am a consultant uh, um, in the healthcare industry um, and I have uh, consulted with long term care residences and group homes. And I don't understand all the traffic all night long. You know, usually for the facilities that I consult with, um, there is activity, but there isn't any activity from around midnight to 6 to 7 in the morning. We have activity going up to that home each and every night. Um, not every night, but I'm just saying it, it's uh, what in the world is going on? You know, it, it, there could be an emergency, but what is the the reason for all of the traffic? Um, I'm not in favor of this increase of residents. Uh, um, we we have this traffic, and I think my neighbor talked about that and, and her young child and that type of thing. So um, I'm definitely not in favor of this variance to increase the residents from six to ten. It isn't re reasonable especially on a cul-de-sac. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Um, Shelley, did you want to finish what you had to say? Okay. So there are, my experience over the last three years, there are people randomly walk around. Um, I was in my kitchen, a person walked through my garage, walked right into my house and asked me for a cigarette lighter. And um, I've had people approach me on my front steps. So, I, I, there is a, they have a perspective of their business and the neighborhood has a perspective of how it's managed. And I think the two are not coming together. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, who, do we have another resident wishing to speak? We do. Uh, the next uh, resident in our queue is Randy and I will attempt this one. So what say, uh, S A W A T Z A Y. If the operator can unmute his line. Yes, can you hear me? Welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Randy Sawatsky. I live at 6214 Brayburn. Um, I will try not to be repetitive over what everybody else said, but some of some of the things I have to say will, will be somewhat close. Uh, my family moved to the neighborhood in July of 2013. 
We were very, very happy that we were able to find a nice place on a cul-de-sac for the lack of traffic, for be a quiet place, good place to get to know the neighbors and things like that. After we were first there, first moved here, uh, that was the case. But since the home has opened up across the street from me, I live very close to them. We have had numerous issues. People have talked about traffic a lot. I want to reiterate that and I want to just talk about how fast they are driving. It's uphill. We're pretty close to the top of the hill. They are really moving when they get to the top of the hill. And in my perspective, and I could be wrong on this, is a lot of these people are dropping off workers, picking up and dropping off workers because you see the same cars. Which brings me to another problem. Uh, Shelly mentioned something about somebody coming in her house. I'd heard about that too. There are a lot of people we don't know on our street doing things that I don't frankly approve of. Uh, late last summer, there was a Toyota that I'd seen a lot of coming and going. And one afternoon, later in the afternoon, I see it parked in front of my house, windows open. So I walked up, I was in the, in the working on the yard and I walked up and I said, uh, can I help you guys? No, no, we're just uh, dropping her off for work. Uh, yeah. N- nothing going on. And there was a strong order of odor of marijuana coming out of the car. There were three people in the car. One of the young ladies got out and walked across the street to the suites and um, the other two drove off. Okay, didn't think much of it, thought I'd let it go. The next afternoon at the same time, the car is there again. I go out, marijuana smoke coming out the windows of the car. It was a nice warm day. I said, okay, you guys are out of here now. You have to leave. They did. Next day, they're there again. I go through the same thing. I was very firm the third day the third day, and didn't say. I probably wasn't as nice as I should have been. They left. Didn't see anything of them. Again, I thought maybe she changed uh, employment or something like that. Uh, as normal, you know, if you talk to the neighbors, I was telling them about this and what had happened. And it turned out that after the, I had chased them away, they moved down lower on the hill and were sitting in the car. Uh, the two residents I talked to that saw them sitting in front of their house did not comment on the on the odors. They just saw people smoking in the car. Uh, we're at the three-minute mark. Okay. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Mr. Um before we bring in it, so I do want to remind all callers that it's it's three minutes per caller, and, and we want to let it. We want to let everyone try to speak, but we just have certain rules that are this way. So if you if you call in once, and we appreciate all the testimony, but you won't be allowed to call in a second time on this matter. And hopefully, someone else will cover the points that you wish to raise on your on a on a repeated call. But do we have other callers? Uh, thank you, Chair Demarov. We do have one more additional caller if the operator uh, can unmute the line of Kirsten or Kirsten Carlson. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Thank you. Okay. Um, yep, so I have lived on Brightburn Circle since uh, 2016. Uh, I I won't sort of repeat what others neighbors have said. I think that they've done a pretty fair job of summarizing the experience that we're all sort of um, feeling living on the street. I have the perspective of also having young children, so I share Lindsay and Rose's concerns about the speed and the cars and um, how it has really changed the character of this of a cult, what we thought would be a cul-de-sac uh, street. Um, I also had reported an incident where a resident had escaped from the home and ended up uh, in my home. I had to call the police and they came out and investigated. There was a, also a investigation that was initiated by uh, the Department of Health as well through the state on that one. Um, there have been other things that we've sort of learned about the home that I feel like have been a little bit misrepresented and 
some of Mr. Hemingway's um, testimony about the um, standards, um, I, he sort of breezed over, but there was a substantiated maltreatment claim that was um, not too long ago in, um, I believe it was uh, in February of 2020, where um, 911 was not called when a resident had a stroke and um, and the proper procedures were not followed. Um, it was also found that that resident was not receiving the meal plan services that they were paying for. So I just, I, I feel like that sort of needed to be said. That was also included in the statement that the neighbors submitted for the commission, um, some of that information. And then I think just going back to the, the kind of what we were talking about at the beginning of the hearing under the Federal Fair Housing Amendments Act, um, it does say that the act states that reasonable accommodations can be denied if the request is not reasonable and if the requested modifications to the rules and policies um, sort of it, it, the, the act says that the if the modifications create a fundamental alteration in the land use or zoning scheme then it, it does not need to be granted or it can be denied and I feel like all of what the neighbors have been saying are we're really trying to say is that all of this activity is creating really a fundamental alteration in what the intent of the zoning scheme is in a residential neighborhood um, single family homes the everyone else on the street it's a single family and then this facility it's really it acts as a as a medical uh, commercial business facility and that's really I think what we're experiencing that it's it's really changed the character of our street and increasing to 10 residents would further change the character of the street. And the last thing I guess I'd like to say is that I'd just like to make the commission aware that this housing with services statute is actually repeat, being repealed in August of 2021. It will no longer be valid. So the statute right now that guarantees that these homes can operate in any residential neighborhood with up to six people will no longer exist. And these You're homes will all need to minutes? obtain. Can I finish my state, my sentence? One, one. Yeah, certainly Ms. Carlson. One, one, just quick wrap I just up, wanted please. To, yeah. I just wanted to say that these, this, this housing with services designation is going away. So all of these homes will need to obtain an assisted living facility license and the, the, the sort of guarantee made by this, the protections, I guess, right now that are made by the statute that allow them to have up to six people in any residential neighborhood will not be there any longer in four months in come August. So I think it's really something for the commission to consider of whether what is the right number of residents, especially on homes, especially on a cul-de-sac, the local municipalities under this new licensing will have the ability to decide what that is. Our, our, the residents on our street don't believe that even six is is reasonable. We feel six has already changed the character, and and maybe the commission should consider looking at possibly four. Um, so we just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Do we have other callers? We do have one additional caller at this time. Uh, if the operator can unmute the line of Laura Sawatsky, uh, when that happens, she may go ahead. Ms. Sawatsky? Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi. Yeah, hi, thanks so much for your time. Um, I am Lori Sawatsky. I live at 6214 Braeburn Circle. My husband is Randy, he's already spoken. Um, I have a, a lot, I actually had a, a write up to, to speak to tonight, but a whole lot of what I wanted to speak to has already been, been discussed, so I think I really just want to take a few minutes to, to reinforce what everyone said. I think that, you know, the, the neighbors in this on this cul-de-sac are truly appreciate the whole desire that um, Geneva Suites has spoken to. That, you know, we do also um, agree that that compromised results like this deserve a dignified place to live. I think the thing that we've all realized and, and witnessed in the last four years is that the, the the biggest issue is that when you're trying to do something like this in a cul-de-sac setting. Um, the kind of establishment, the kinds of people comings and goings that we, we run up against are just simply not fitting for the cul-de-sac. And there's really no way that um, that you can have a, a situation like this in a cul-de-sac without fundamentally changing 
the type of neighborhood and the zoning that we're dealing with here. Um, we witnessed, as everyone has said, you know, everything from the, the dramatic increase in traffic since we first lived here seven years ago has been really incredible. Um, we are we are served up all kinds of disturbing sites. Um, one one snowstorm a, a couple of years ago, we we all witnessed a dead body being wheeled down the street of the, in the middle of the, of the night, of the middle of a snowstorm. Um, as my husband mentioned, we've got cars filled with with strangers smoking pot. Um, we're in a situation where we've got young kids that are they're growing up in a street where they don't have the safe feel safe to be able to to ride their bikes and and ride roller skates on the cul-de-sac without worrying about passing cars or strangers that they just don't even know who are who they are sitting in cars staring at them. Um, so overall, I just you know I, I would appeal to the to the to the, the decision makers here that um, while we think that we're full support of integrating group homes in a neighborhood, this kind of environment is just not the place for it. And that um, perhaps if Geneva Suites feels so strongly that this is the kind of environment that they want to set up for their for their home for their for their residents, that perhaps a different um, location would be a better space space for it. And that's really all I had to say. Uh, thanks for so much for your time, and I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Are there any other callers? At this point, there are no other callers in the queue. So if you're comfortable moving forward, I think uh, we can go ahead. Well, I would like to just wait perhaps 30 seconds or so. I see 852 on my, my computer says 852. We'll wait till 853 just to make sure we're not missing anyone. At this point, no, we do not have any additional callers in queue. Okay, well then, um, I guess we should entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I move to close the public hearing. Is that good? Thanks. Um, Ms. Olson, could you uh, do a roll vote for that, please? Thank you. Commissioner Elkire? Aye. Commissioner Bennett? Aye. Commissioner Berube? Aye. Commissioner Agnew? Aye. Commissioner Miranda? Aye. Commissioner Bartling? Aye. Chair Nemrov? Aye. So with that, I'd like, be, before I bring up the planning discussion, uh, planning commission discussion, I'd like to just circle back on some of the comments received. And perhaps um, others have any. Um, I, I would ask the applicant. We, we obviously we we got several calls about traffic and deliveries and and nighttime traffic. Could you comment on that? I mean, do you, it, uh, could yeah? If you just comment and respond to those issues that were raised. Yes. Uh, I think Scott Hemingway and Matt Hanley are still on the line. Either one of them uh, could address those questions. So this is Matt. Um, I'm happy to give a couple of points that, you know, I understand there's a lot of points that were made and by no means do I want to dismiss any of them specifically, but um, a couple of things that stood out to me is, you know, we have three shift changes per, per day, um, one at 6 a.m., one at 2 p.m. in the afternoon and one at 10 p.m. And they um, will be more consistent with the staffing that we're recommending for the increase to 10. So that would, again, it still does lead to less, but middle of the night traffic and those types of things, uh, frankly, doesn't make any sense because we have consistent staffing from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And there's no reason for people to come and go. Um, so, you know, as far as I can't speak to, I don't live there. so. I can't speak to the exact traffic and what the origins are, but you know, uh, I think the other, maybe the other big thing is I heard up to three deliveries a day for med deliveries. Uh, in speaking with my 
director of nursing, I asked how many med deliveries should there be to that home on a regular basis? Um, she responded there should be one delivery per week, and there are some ancillary deliveries. Um, again, I think when you speak from six to 10, the med deliveries come from one pharmacy, so they can be consolidated. So this wouldn't lead to more traffic as a result of what it is currently. Um, so I think that's, uh, I think a couple of points that are important to make for you guys to consider. And I'll leave it to Scott here to respond if he has something to add. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is that okay if I speak? I'm in way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have a whole lot more to add other than um, there was early on um, some attempt um, with both the neighbors and ourselves to have some communication. And for a little while there, I thought that it was it was constructive. Um, I think that there's an opportunity to have communication again um, to help uh, ease um, some of the anxiety. Um, oftentimes when communication goes away, then anxiety increases and speculation increases and so many things go haywire. And I guess I'd just like to make um, make the make on the record that um, were we as a group, myself, are more than happy to have um, further conversations with neighbors. Um, the last conversation I had with or communication I had with one of the neighbors, um, I was told that uh, I should come out to the cul-de-sac for a meeting and bring my attorney. And so I, that being said, I am very open to having dialogue. We've had dialogue in other neighborhoods and um, to the point where um, for a little while we had um, a, a, we have an open line, a telephone number, email, where if um, a neighbor sees something that uh, that they don't, they think might be wrong, uh, they can call us and contact us, and we're more than willing to uh, address it. And quite frankly, um, anytime something is brought to our attention, we do address it immediately. Uh, we're very proactive on things. So, um, just want to make sure. Uh, and, and Matt's right. I I don't know. I guess I can't speculate on on the night driving. I don't know why that would be. Um, yeah. Happy to answer any other questions though. Thanks. Um, let's see, a couple others. Have we got one or two comments about marijuana use that people believe is coming from people affiliated with your building? I mean, is there, in marijuana use on the street. I mean, is there anything you could say about that or? Uh, if I knew about it, I I guess I could speak to it. Um, this is the first time I've heard of it. Um, if I knew that there was any issues or any relation to anybody utilizing narcotics, um, illegal narcotics and, and working for us, we would be on top of that immediately. Um, we don't allow it and we won't allow it going forward either so um if if uh, i would suggest to any of the neighbors that uh they hear that um we would love to know immediately because we'll take action asap thanks mr hemingway and then one final thing i'm not sure you know uh, which member of your team should respond there seems to be a a debate about service calls and i'm not you know maybe somebody said there was 50 some calls or something i i can't find my number quickly is it different mr. I mean, chair comment on that sure mr yeah. chair i'll take a stab at that um so i have the same uh, police reports as all of you do i counted up uh, a couple of times because i wanted to be accurate the number of calls the first uh, set of calls that I distinguished were 18 calls regarding uh, parking. Those parking complaints ended in June of 2019. And so those 18 calls over the three plus years of operations uh, related to parking. Approximately 25 to 26 calls over that same period related to emergency um, services, which we talked about. 
and those average over the operations about six to seven a year. Um, I am aware that there has been a spike in calls over the last couple of months. Uh, Scott or Matt could address why that is, but over the average, the, the number that I gave was correct. Uh, there were a couple of um, calls uh, related to you know wrong address or wrong um, directions, uh, so folks got lost, I guess. Uh, and then there were one or two calls related to theft, uh, and those can be addressed also by Scott and Matt, but I will tell you that one of the theft calls related to an iPad that was found in a laundry basket. Uh, when when things go missing in a facility like this, they have to be reported. That's the law, and so that's the procedure that's followed. And then an iPad turns up in a in a laundry basket. Another one was a, a resident, and I don't want to get into too many de details, uh, hiding his meds. But um, so that we'll just leave it at that. So, you know, again, if if you want to talk about you know what the experience is over these facilities it's on average one call per resident per year um, there has been as the neighbor testified uh, there has been an increase in the last couple of months and you know there's no particular rhyme or reason to how calls come in it's when they're needed um, you know if someone reports chest pain um, the facility is obligated to make a call for emergency uh, services uh, that's that's required of them just as if you know, uh, one of us had the same condition, we'd want to be able to have access to those services. So I don't know if, if you want to take any further testimony on that, but that's I, I look, looked at the same materials that you all did. I counted them. I counted them up a couple of times because I wanted to be accurate in my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. Do uh, I, that 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 concludes my review of the feedback comments we got. Do any other commissioners have anything they heard in public testimony they want to review, or any other questions or comments that you'd like to make at this time? This is the portion of the program where the Planning Commission has a discussion. So I'd like to open it to other members of the commission if you have any comments you'd like to make or anything, any further questions you'd like to ask. I could call on you. Commissioner Bennett. I'll make this quick, which is unusual, right? Oh, man. So it seems before us, we have those two decisions, reasonable and necessity. I feel from both testimonies, both sides from the public, which was largely not in favor of granting this as reasonable. And uh, obviously, the applicant is in favor. Seems like there's just we're weighing two things on a balance. I, I see how this is reasonable from one perspective, but not reasonable from for the other. So I, I guess I just, I'm currently leaning in favor of not being reasonable, uh, counting everything, but just figured maybe that would spark some discussion. Here for your spark, Commissioner Bennett. Hey, do it. Any be, other I'll commissioners? Be, of Commission I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to follow that up if if we're now in the point of giving our opinions based on the facts that have been relayed to us. Um, so first of all, um, diversity, including disability, um, I think it only enhances our neighborhoods. It's important that we support it in the neighborhoods. In my opinion, um, I think there's a real need for housing. I see that need for housing for all different kinds of housing, um, but especially for disabled or um, elderly to have this kind of residential housing. And, and I want to support that. Um, I do think what we need to look at here though, is a home that has six residents. They, the proposal is to increase it to 10. That's more than a 60% increase. So when you're asking for that kind of increase, I think the argument has to be made on evidence, logic, and precedence. It's not about parking. It's not about, you know, were there this many service calls or that many service calls. I think we need to think about, there's six residents there. Presumably they're there because they want to be there and it's a good place to live. Perhaps they're there because there's no other place to live, but they're there. So where is their voice? 
And why, why are we not hearing from them or an advocate for some, them saying, you know, um, Mr. Hemingway, Mr. Hanley, and Mr. Griffith all said staff is not going to increase. It stretches the bounds of credibility to say you're going to increase more than 60% and you're not going to increase staff. The, the, let's go back to necessity. We need to talk about those six people who are currently living there. How can you increase by 60%? and expect them to have the same quality of life. We'll be doing a huge disservice to them. Talk about discrimination. Let's, let's talk about protecting the people who we've been paid to protect. And let's take care of those people before we expand our business. There's been no evidence that you've got the capability to care for 10 people. There's been no logic because we know 10 people takes more staff than six, and you have no precedent. You have no experience caring for 10 people in a home. So I am strongly opposed to this. It has nothing to do with being opposed to diversity. It has nothing to do with not supporting people with disabilities. I think you don't have evidence, you don't have logic, you don't have precedence, you don't have a case. And if you want to make a change on a residence, you need to follow the code because someone's got to protect the safety of those six people who currently live there. Thank you, Commissioner Berube. Uh, other commissioners, I, Commissioner Bartling, I see that you're off mute. Would you like to say or ask something, say something or ask something? Yep. Um, I, you know, I I would agree with Sheila and, and on most accounts and mostly I would, you know, talk about the, the code piece. I know we're not here to approve that, but in order as an architect, I know for them to match the code that would be required for that, there would be change in the exterior of the home that would affect the neighborhood and the feeling of the neighborhood. And it is a residential R1 single family neighborhood. Um, again, I would, you know, if this were in a more of a, multifamily or a commercial district, I might feel differently. Um, but in this case, I, I am in agreement with Commissioner Barubi. Thank you, Commissioner Bartling. Any other commissioners wish to ask questions or, or, or express an opinion? Um, I can speak. Sure, yes, you can. Commissioner Miranda. Um, I'm really struggling with this. Um, on the one hand, I totally understand the, the neighbors and uh, the feeling they have and the, the increase in traffic and whatnot. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it, it, you know, it's definitely more, you know, it's busier than it would be if, you know, probably if a single family lived there. But, um, you know, is this fundamentally, unreasonable or fundamental alteration um, in the zoning scheme, you know, I can't see that. I, I, I guess I'm just not seeing that. It's, uh, you know, residential facility, people are living there. And I mean, sure, there's medical assistance, but um, it's, uh, it doesn't feel like it's fundamentally different to me. So um, I'm, I'm tending towards um, thinking that it should be allowed based on what I've heard tonight. Thank you. Commissioner Miranda, any other commissioners? Let's see. I'll, who... I'll go on this is Commissioner Agnew. Oh, hi. Um, hi. Welcome. Sorry, I'm just Agnew. not on video right now. Um, you know, I, I'm really looking at the main points of is it a necessity and is it reasonable? Um, and, and I happen to agree, you know, full heartedly with uh, Commissioner Berube in really thinking about the experience that the current residents would would have by increasing by an additional four occupants. Um, you know, I think about that space as their home today and what would it mean to have four more people living there? And and when I think about, you know, one of the, the requirements as, you know, would it better benefit um, 
those with the, the disabilities. And I'm just really not seeing that um, necessity uh, requirement being met here. Um, and then is it reasonable? And I, I don't think that it is reasonable. This is a single family neighborhood. And right now having six you know, residents there feels like the right fit for that home, for that neighborhood. Um, and so it's, it's really thinking about how would this increase affect the character of the neighborhood? And I, I don't think that it would be a positive effect. And therefore, you know, I don't think it is, is reasonable. Um, so those are the two things that I'm really rooting my decision in on, on this call tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Agnew. So I think everyone's, Ms. Commissioner Elkire, have you had an opportunity? Yeah, I'd just like to, um, to build on what a few other commissioners have said. My main concern is around uh, reasonableness. And it, it appears to me that um, the facility has already, uh, to a certain extent, altered the character of the neighborhood. And in the, in the, using the language of the, the staff's description, created the appearance of a commercial or medical operation within a, within a residential zoning district. It's, it sure seems like that's the status quo. And it also seems most likely that increasing occupancy by two thirds is, is not gonna mitigate that, but rather is more likely to exacerbate it and make it worse. Uh, so it, it feels uh, to me on the reasonableness element of the decision, I'm leaning towards a no. Commissioner Elkayer. Um I see Commissioner Strauss dialed in, but Jerry, I, you don't have, do you, do you wish to say anything? You, you don't have to, um, but thank you and welcome, welcome to be here tonight. Um, so my thoughts are, are basically what is reasonable and you know, I, I think what, what is reasonable historically has been something we, we all want to come up with something re that's reasonable for this kind of need, even in a single family residential neighborhood. And historically, reasonable has been determined by state statute as being six residents. And I think the evidence that we're hearing tonight is that that may be pushing it for some neighborhoods. Um, now, we aren't supposed to consider the financial impact or the financial dealings for the applicant. We also are not supposed to consider the popularity or unpopularity among the citizens of a proposal. We, we're supposed to deal with the zoning code and the applicable laws. And um, up till now, the state has, up, up till now and through August, the state has determined that reasonable is six residents in this kind of facility. But, but I think we're seeing with this facility that it's kind of stretching already what the neighborhood can bear. And further, um, it does sound like, according to the city's building leader, that it increased over six, literally under the, the law, the state's building code, converts it from a residential property to a commercial property. And we shouldn't be imposing commercial, I, I don't think it's reasonable to impose a commercial property in a residential neighborhood. Um, I'm going to disagree a little bit with the idea that we should not, that we don't deal with the external. I think we need to, because it's unknown and at best I will say that it's disputed what kind of external changes will need to occur, that I have to contemplate it as if there will be significant external changes in combination with being a commercial medical building that will further negatively impact the neighborhood. So with that, I, I find the requested increase to not be reasonable. And that's, that's my position. Um, if anyone else has any further questions or comments have added, if anyone else has, would like to make a motion, um, that would be welcome also. I'd like to make a motion that we deny the proposal to, uh, for the variance. I second that motion. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? We, we've had a good airing. I'd like to allow further discussion could, by the Planning Commission. 
If I could just or, just yeah, sorry. If I could just jump in to be to be clear, based on the findings that are outlined in the staff recommendation, and if you have any other findings that you wanted to add to that, you could do that as well. Planner Teague, you are always welcome to jump in. Um, do we have any other findings? Do, so let's go back and look at the staff memo. And I would I would particularly ask that Commissioner Barubi and Commissioner Agnew look at the staff memo because they're the motioners and the seconders and see if there's if that meets. It looks like the it looks like it's on starts on page five. And if, if that if that is all your thoughts or if there's anything you'd like to add, and I would also ask if there are any members of the commission who would like to make any friendly suggest any modifications to that, but. Start with uh, Commissioner Barubi and Commissioner Agnew. Yeah, I, I, I reiterate my proposal to um, deny the requested variance as stated in the staff memo. Yes, I can. Uh, okay. Anyone with any amendments? Any further discussion? Assistant planner, Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote on that motion to deny? Thank you. Commissioner Alpire. So an I vote is, is saying yes, you deny. Is that correct? Planner Teague? That's, that's correct. I'll Commissioner Alkire. Call again, just in case. Commissioner Alkire. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Bruby. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Chair Nemirov. Thank you, everyone. I believe the applicant will they they have an opportunity to pursue this further. I believe. Uh, that is a, a final decision. However, they could appeal to the city council. Thank you, Planner Teague, and and thank you, to the applicant. Thank you. We we do did give us plenty to think about. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda for the evening is a 68 square foot variance for a garage addition at 6213 Tracy Hello. Avenue. And with that, we bring Hello. up assistant planner, Chris Ocker again. Thank you, chair, members of the planning commission. So this request is a 68 square foot variance for a detached garage addition for property located on the east side of Tracy Avenue as highlighted. It consists of a Rambler with a detached two car garage and what they're requesting is a 68 square foot variance to increase their existing garage. Um, their proposal is to double the size of their garage. Uh, the existing garage is here. And they would like to add on um, literally the same amount, maybe just a little bit more. This came in under a building permit. The property owner was unaware that there is a, a section of the code that requires that all outbuildings combined, so all accessory structures on any R1 lot can't exceed a thousand square feet. So the addition to the garage, which is meant to accommodate their cars, some storage and a boat, um, actually totals 1,068 square feet. So it's, it's a little bit over the maximum allowable limit, um, but it is well within the maximum allowable coverage of 25%. So um, a 540 square foot garage addition will increase the footprint by 68 square feet, um, which is not allowed uh, beyond the 1,000 square feet. To meet the accessory building requirement, the addition would have to be minimized to, shallow, to be a shallow garage depth. And according to the 
property owner, it would not fit the boat, which is really um, basis for the of needing to add on to the garage. And this was um, a surprise to the property owner in terms of, um, you know, they were prepared to add on to their garage. And unfortunately, um, they have to go through the variance process in order to accomplish uh, the 68 square foot variance. Um, so this is uh, the drawings, the addition towards the back of the garage. There won't be any change to the front of the building. Uh, this is a, a top view or a roof view of the garage, which will be extending uh, the garage further into the rear yard. Grading the drainage plan has already been reviewed by the engineering department the building permit process. So this is the house, um, single story home. You can see the detached garage, it's further back uh, from the front of the a wall of the house. Uh, this view will not change um, because the addition will go further back into the rear yard. The neighbor to the south who is most affected has their garage adjacent to it. So it's a garage to garage situation. And there is quite a bit of distance between the two structures. Here's another view of that. And then across the street, you have the um, fire station and then also a uh, public park. So um, does it, is it a reasonable request in terms of, does it relieve practical difficulties? Intent of the ordinance is to limit the number of outbuildings on a lot. Um, so in the fixed total combined square footage of a thousand square feet, the ordinance does provide flexibility for accessory structures. However, that limit um, total area count for building coverage does um, is a disadvantage for the larger lots, given that um, a smaller lot has the same amount of square footage that they have to uh, abide by. Some of the larger lots, they're not closer to the lot coverage requirements, but um, they, in this particular instance, um, they will not be able to have any other accessory structures on the property, um, even though they're well below uh, the coverage requirements, they would be uh, along with that garage addition, not even at 13% coverage. Uh, so if they wanted to go forward and have an additional accessory structure, they would have to go through the variance process. Um, will the variance alter the essential character of the neighborhood? Really, um, from the street view, there will be no visible changes whatsoever. And again, there will be no other additional accessory structures. So staff does support the request and recommends approval. Um, would subject it to the, the survey and uh, plan state stamp March 11th, 2021. Um, we do have the property owner, Mark Salisbury, and uh, his contractor, Tim Kimbrough, present uh, to answer questions as well. And with that, I will stop and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Planner Ocker. Do any members of the uh, commission have questions for staff? I do. Mr. Bennett. So I have two questions based off of the presentation so far. Um, you said the intent of this, basically this rule is to limit the number of outbuildings. Is it also to limit the size of the outbuildings or the number of outbuildings? Uh, both. It really is to limit both. Um, it was a way to address both issues. So um, you're not limited to the number, but you're limited to the amount, the total amount of square footage. It really does work against a lot of those larger lots. Um, we've had a lot of the larger lot owners bump into the issue when they want pool cabanas and gazebos and sheds or, or an extra detached garage because a thousand square feet doesn't go very far if you have a lar large property that you could accommodate that with. Sure. I guess the second question I have is what technically designates an accessory or an accessory structure or outbuilding? What type of separation has to occur? Because sometimes you see detached garage way in between or a pergola connecting them are those not technically outbuildings and is there a sneaky workaround <laughs> I, I i just want to be aware sure um <laughs> if it's attached in any way shape or form in terms of a uh, roof or walls then it's part of the principal principal structure and it would be subjected to those setback requirements 
and it would not be subjected to an accessory structure setback requirement or that thousand square feet total. But it would if be. They put a beam in between the, the garage and the house. This wouldn't be ahead between, I guess, before us. Pardon me? If they put a beam between the garage and the house. This wouldn't be before us. Like a pergola or something. Yes. If they walking. attached it to the house, it would not be part of the, it would not be a variance request. That's correct. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Ms. Zucker, I just had one question. That is on the survey that we received. It appears, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, which I very well may be, but it appears that with the proposed garage, that the percent of hardcover or impervious surface on this property will be 12.76%. Is that correct? Yes, it'll be under 13%. Okay, thank you. Anyone else with any questions? Uh, would Mr. Salisbury or anyone else for the applicant like to make a presentation? You don't. You aren't required to. This is this is Mark Salisbury. I I just wanted okay. to thank thank. Uh, I I don't have a a long presentation, but I just wanted to thank uh, uh, the Planning Commission for their for their review of our application and and uh, really appreciate your time and and thoughtful analysis. Um, and just you know, we aren't um, you know we we have no intent to add other structures. We're trying to sort of uh, accommodate our needs in one existing structure with you know and not try to um you know change the character of the 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 house or the the area and you know this wouldn't really um in, impact uh the the um the view as you know as you pointed out the view of the um view from the street um so i, I just i um i hope um Really, really not hoping hoping that this would be viewed as a as a kind of a minor accommodation, and and it has a significant impact in terms of being able to um, store the boat in the garage and and also the the cars and sort of keep those off the the driveway and sort of present a much cleaner look for the neighbors. Thank you, Mr. Salisbury. Do anyone have it? Do any commissioners have questions for the applicant? Well, maybe we will later, but thank you for your presentation. So with that, this is a public hearing. Uh, this is our final public hearing of the evening, but it is open to members of the public who'd like to call in and give testimony. If you are listening or watching tonight's meeting and you'd like to call in and give testimony, you'll have up to three minutes. Please call 1-800-374-0221. Enter conference ID 962888. Two eight, press star one, and city staff member will put you into queue. You'll be asked to give your name and your address, and um, you know we uh, we just ask that you try not to duplicate any other co comments that have been made by anyone else. So with that, I'll turn to the city AV department and ask if we have any callers. Thank you, Chair Nemirov. Uh, at this moment, there are no callers in queue. There are a couple callers still on the line. So if we want to give them a minute or so to have an opportunity to join the queue, if they'd like, we can do so. I have 929 on my clock. I'll wait till 930. Sounds good. That marks 9.30 and we do not have anyone in the queue. Thank you. So with that, uh, we can close the public hearing. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? I'll move to close the public hearing. Second. Uh, Ms. Olson, can you do a roll vote to close the public hearing? Thank you. Commissioner Alkire? 
Aye. Commissioner Bennett? Aye. Commissioner Bruby? Aye. Commissioner Agnew? Aye. Commissioner Miranda? Aye. Commissioner Bartling? Aye. Chair Nemrov? Aye. So we've closed the public hearing. Now it's the opportunity for planning commission to ask any further questions or have a discussion or make a motion. But any, does anyone have any feedback they'd like to share? Commissioner Bennett. Yeah, so, yeah, I wasn't, I just posed some questions earlier, not meant to do specifically like sneaky workarounds, but it does, seem that, <laughs> you know, based off of the size of a lot and the nature of a house and certainly a detached garage, if you have one, you're, you're just put at a disadvantage in accordance with this one. If this house had the garage attached to it, I mean, it has the same hardscape, same massing, same everything. Um, but if you're adding on to a garage and your garage already counts as that, a thousand square feet doesn't go that long way. I mean, you divide, you know, 20 by 20 is 400. And that, that barely fits two cars. So having a detached garage there put at a disadvantage um, that they did not create on their own. That's just the nature of what's... Um, on their themselves and their property i see this as completely reasonable doesn't change the character of the neighborhood and fully support it do any other commissioners have any comments or any questions yeah I, I, I would just follow up with that um kind of in a similar line of thinking given the building height and the massing it, it's indistinguishable from the front so you're adding you know six percent onto the back that no one's going to see anyway because it backs up to a garage um, and it doesn't change the, the scale of the neighborhood. It doesn't change anything. Um, and so I would be in support of this. Ruby, anyone else with any comments or motions? Commissioner Bartling, did you have something? Um, you yeah, don't have to. I, <laughs> I, I agree. I think it seems quite reasonable and it, what Commissioner Bennett said uh, with, you know, the detached garage, which is much less common in Edina than say Minneapolis, you know, they're put at a great disadvantage with that. So I think it's completely reasonable and approved. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Any it sounds like we're all, it sounds like you're all kind of saying similar things. Anyone like to make a motion or? Yeah, I'll, move I'll make a motion to approve. Oh, you got it. <laughs> I'll second yours. Okay. Is, are there any other further comments? Hearing none, Ms. Olson, can you do a roll vote to approve this as presented in the staff memo? Thank you. Commissioner Elkhair? Commissioner Elkhair? Aye. Commissioner Bennett? Aye. Commissioner Berube? Aye. Commissioner Agnew? Aye. Commissioner Miranda? Aye. Commissioner Bartling? Aye. Karen Nemrod? Well, Mr. Salisbury, congratulations. It's been approved. Thank you, Thank you for much. coming. Well, that takes us to the end of the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting and now we have reports and recommendations. We have two sketch plans. First of all, there's a sketch plan review for 5146 Eden Avenue, the former public works site. And let's see, who's presenting on behalf of the city is Community Development Director, Carrie Teague. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, members of the commission. So I will share my screen. Okay, so this property is located in the Grandview District. It's the old public work site. The site's currently vacant today, as you can see. It's adjacent to the railroad tracks, and Jerry's, uh, Jerry's Supermarket is located to the west. The property today is zoned industrial. It still has the old zoning designation of the old public work site. So rezoning is necessary here. The site is guided in the comprehensive plan for mixed use. 
similar to the, all the uses to the north, um, more of the, the commercial and residential uses. So what the applicant is proposing here is to build a five and six story uh, co-op. There would be 90 units within the building, owner occupied. 10% of the units within the, the project would be uh, for affordable housing. So a little bit different from what we've seen in a lot of projects recently in that this would be uh, owner occupied uh, senior co-op. On the south end of the site would be a three story, 40,000 square foot medical office. Uh, most of the parking would be uh, below the structures here as you can't really see from uh, see them from this angle. Uh, one uh, feature of the project of note here is this pedestrian walkway and bridge that would eventually connect to the, the Jerry's parking ramp. This is an element from the Grandview development framework that was created, oh, really about 10 years ago now. The idea, and I'll show a picture of it, but the idea is to provide a walkway from City Hall into the Grandview District. Um, so that would be provided for. There's also a public space in the middle of the, of the site. This is about a little over 10,000 square feet. Um, uh, the, the, again, that, that would be for, for the public. Here's that walkway that I mentioned. So City Hall is at the bottom of the screen. The idea is to have a, create a pedestrian bridge over Highway 100, eventually to connect to Jerry's. This is the Jerry's site here. You can see the Jerry's Tower. The site we're looking at is right here. Within that framework document, um, we often talked about creating a public building on the site. And the city has tried for many years to, to accommodate that. Um, but it, it just hasn't worked out. Here again is City Hall. You can see the bridge across uh, to connect the site. Another element here of the project, um, the city is planning to put in a roundabout here at Arcadia and Eden. And the city engineer has been working with adjacent property owners um, and developing plans for this. Um, so the plans were developed initially around what we thought was going to be the um, the location of the roundabout. However, we've been unable to acquire land to the south, so the cul-de-sac has to shift to the north a little bit. So that's what the red lines indicate on the screen. Um, so that would have to be shifted. So you can see where the pedestrian sidewalk comes into this area here, this would have to be shifted to um, in back of that red line. Be no impact up here in this area, uh, but this would have to be to be shifted with any formal formal application. So that sidewalk gets a little tight to the building. Again, here's a look at, at the project. So as I mentioned, a rezoning is required here, and there would also be a number of, um, it, the rezoning would be to planned unit development. That's where we, we would use the PUD here to ensure the affordable housing and provide some flexibility, you know, ensure those public spaces that, we, that I talked about earlier. Uh, but they'd also be asking for some flexibility on setbacks, um, primarily along Eden and Arcadia. Also, this site is, there's a the height overlay on this calls for four stories and 48 feet. So this project would be uh, six stories and 71 feet. In terms of FAR, the uh, FAR for the existing property, the planned industrial district is 0.5. However, all the commercial properties around it, the FAR allowed is 1.5, and that is what's, what's being requested as part of this project. Um, and they'd be looking at some flexibility in regard to parking stalls as well. The usual parking and traffic studies uh, would, be, would be done as part of the request. So again, as I mentioned, a rezoning to PUD uh, would be required. So some of the items for you to discuss this evening is the density. What's proposed here is 28 units per acre. The comp plan calls for up to 100, so the density is reasonable. 
I touched on the Grandview development framework. Again, the plan calls for that bridge and sidewalk and green space. Uh, the applicant has also indicated a willingness for potential for some type of district parking on the site. Um, touched on the, the roundabout uh, setbacks. So to clarify, buildings would be on Eden, 17 feet from the curb. The building that was recently built to the west, those apartments on the other side of the railroad tracks, that has a setback of 19 feet. So we're looking at a roughly similar uh, to what was built further to the, the west. And the commission might want to also comment on their um, thoughts on the height. Oftentimes as part of the Grandview, um, during that study, we talked about buildings not exceeding the height of the Jerry's Tower, uh, which uh, this project would not do. So in general, it's kind of um, meeting that the spirit of the study. So I will stop there. Uh, the development team is here to uh, make a presentation as well, but I can stop and answer any questions you may have, or we could turn it over to the uh, the developer. Does anyone have any questions for staff, or would you like to hear from the development team? Commissioner Bennett. Hey, Kerry, quick question. Um, there's a lot of history that we're not going over here, um, but could you sum up between the last proposal that was uh, put forth just over two years ago, why that didn't happen and the city still owns this property, right? So how much of this proposal that we're seeing has been crafted in concert with the HRA, if at all? Yes, so yeah, they are aware of the project. They have asked uh, Brown Chu, the development team here to, to put a proposal together and move through the, the development review process. So there is a, is a relationship uh, with the HRA and the applicant here. The, the last proposal you may remember had the, the 17 uh, story tower, residential tower um, and some public space in putting, you know, and it was pretty well received by both planning commission and city council, unfortunately, the financing of it with all of that district parking, the public space, just the cost of underground parking, the numbers just didn't work out. So that, that project um, was unable to move forward. Commissioner Bennett, do you have anything further? I have a lot further, but I'll save it. Okay, okay. Commissioner Elkire. Um. Mr. Teague, I think this is a question for you. The, the Grandview Development Framework talked about uh, having a road connection between Arcadia and Vernon. And it was in some of the pictures that you just showed a few minutes ago. I was just curious, it seems, uh, it seems like this, this project would make that no longer possible. It could still be a, a pedestrian or a bike path connecting over to Vernon, but it looked like there wouldn't be enough space left to have a, 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 a road for cars. Does that fit with the dimensions as you see them? Uh, yeah, so there still would be a roadway from Arcadia up to Vernon with a, I'll share my screen again and show that. I kind of skipped over this slide. So here's the, the sidewalk that would be along Arcadia. So this, this road here would still connect up to Vernon. Hmm. Arcadia yeah, I here, the, the, in the drawings, I was talking about a roadway which would go across the northern border of the public works lot, the public works site, so east-west from Arcadia to Vernon. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so th this, um, yeah, the idea is that it would still go through and connect all the way to Vernon. Okay. Okay. 
Hi, and uh, this is Jerry Strauss. Oh, hello, Jerry. Yeah, hey. yeah. Thank you. I could. Would it be appropriate? I I did have a question for Carrie. I I'm sort of monitoring the meeting, but um, it would be okay for me to ask him a question. Certainly, Jerry. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you for thank you for joining us tonight. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm doing fine. Um, Carrie, you know we have looked at any number of proposals um, on this site, and they all had a very large public use component. Um, most, the biggest feature was you know in the art center, but the 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 grand plaza and all this other. Um, I don't see that being an element of this perhaps that that's the road or that's a that's an option that has been kind of reviewed and no longer part of the consideration or expectation um, but it was so much it was such a big part of earlier versions and now I'm not seeing any I just was curious yeah, it, it, it certainly was. And I think the, the city council may still struggle with that notion because that, that was a pretty um, that was a pretty prominent feature of the framework document. The idea was what's to do district parking here, public buildings, park, you know, there's a lot of asks within the plan. Um, and I know they've they've tried for years to to try to accommodate that, but but you're right, this proposal does not have that. Anyone else with any questions for staff? What, Commissioner Bartling, were you raising your, sorry, um, with that, uh, I think we have a few people from the applicant here, uh, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Williamson. I don't know if any others. If you'd like to make a presentation, we'd be ha we'd look forward to hearing from you. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Planning Commissioners. Thank you. This is Dave Anderson with Crown and Shoe, uh, and uh, Dean Williamson, my colleagues, uh, with me as well. We have members of our uh, co-development team, Alex Hall with United Properties is with us this evening as our members of our uh, design and planning team um, from Pope uh, Associates, Paul Holmes and Brian Larson and Vicki Vandell from Laux Associates. So thank you. We know you've had a long meeting, so we'll, we'll make a brief presentation. And uh, uh, knowing that this is a sketch plan review and knowing that this is a very early and preliminary design discussion, we'll try to uh, respond to some of the, the questions that came up here initially, but uh, just walk you through the concept um, talk a bit about um, you know what led to these uh, uses and the components that have come together, and, um, and and perhaps we can respond to some you know some of the the work we have been uh, uh, doing with the HRA directly. And I think that question was asked, but uh, what you're seeing here tonight really is out of the work effort with the HRA since uh, early uh, part of this year. So uh, we discussed this concept, and uh, that led to uh, putting together a framework for how we would proceed uh, forward with planning and determining the feasibility of these plan components and um, and then certainly going through um, the, the process including the sketch plan uh, review so i look forward to uh, hearing your, your questions uh, here a bit later i would say one of the overarching um, components or, or certainly elements of our thinking about this site uh, and and with some history to it, but you know the the feasibility aspects of these uses we will talk about. But the 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 guiding uh, principles here are the uh, the seven guiding principles of the Grand View Grand View District and the framework. And we've outlined it in the uh, uh, narrative that we provided you, and I think it's referenced in the staff report. Uh, Carrie did a nice job summarizing the development. So. I think with that, uh, just making those notes will certainly uh, be available to answer questions and we'll have uh, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Larson start off with uh, a bit of an overview on the, some of the planning aspects. Uh, Alex Hall will uh, speak to a little bit more about the senior cooperatives in that model and why senior cooperatives for this site. And then uh, we'll uh, uh, quickly and briefly um, talk a bit about the medical office uh, here and try to keep our uh, comments here to 
about uh, 10, 10 minutes of, of uh, presentation. So thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, if I could, um, uh, Brian Larson would make a presentation. Larson. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks for your uh, consideration and your endurance here tonight. Um, let's see, are we, are we seeing my screen shared here? Okay. Yes, we see it now. Great. Um, Planner team did a great job of, of summarizing the site. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just to be familiar with everything, um, really, we, we can only access the site from the south and from the east with the railroad tracks on the west and, and commercial development on the north. And um, as I think many of you know, this site drops, uh, has a considerable topography drop of uh, 35 feet or so from the north to the south. And so that gives us some, some opportunities. It also gives us some constraints. But the, the location of this site has been pointed out is just really critical in, in enhancing connections that uh, pedestrian especially that uh, and, and that is happening along Eden with an extended sidewalk that doesn't exist on the north side now with the new city work being done. It's it's happening on a boulevard along Arcadia here um, that connects north and south and then the pedestrian um, easement and connection and bridge across the railroad tracks that Kerry was talking about. And really it's all about you know connecting some existing parking, leveraging it and using it um, and using the opportunity for future redevelopment to also connect to that as well as the development on this site. And so um, again, medical office building on, on the bottom, public plaza in the middle, senior co-op on the top. And we enter each of these developments uh, in two locations. So at, at the lower end, we have a drop off and, and uh, turn around at the medical office building that goes into a parking structure below grade. Then the next entrance is a part is on top of that parking structure for the medical office building. So we have you know two pretty good sized floor plates and then on the lower level of the medical office we wrap the parking garage with some office and lobby so that you know most of this parking is pushed under the grade and that gives us the opportunity to do that. So this sort of shared public space is open to Arcadia and open to a courtyard that sits up above it slightly with some stairs coming down. Senior co-op has five levels over one level of parking on the east. It has five levels over two levels of parking on the west. So what it gives us an opportunity is that upper level can walk out to a rooftop deck that has some views, of course, in, in several directions. And then finally, the, the, the uh, resident parking happens off of Arcadia for, for all the residents, that's, and that's all below grade here. Um, visitors drop-offs happen at the north with this auto court. And then visitor parking, uh, guest parking, uh, comes in right there. So there's a courtyard to the north, courtyard to the south. And then finally, the, uh, the walkway, bike path, we have connections to this co-op and then it'll connect off to the east. It's, you know, it's a little complex as far as all these different levels, but it, you know, this drawing might show at best, this red line is Arcadia, a section through Arcadia. So if we start at the north, we're entering that auto court. Arcadia, this red line is moving south. We're entering the, this level of parking. This is that plaza green that doesn't have any parking or structure under it. And finally, that first level of covered parking that the medical building sort of slides under. And that's, that's, that's the most of it. I think we could just go to the, uh, to the renderings and we can certainly back off to any of these other things. But, you know, we, as Kerry said, we have a little adjustment happening here with the change in the in the roundabout. But what we're trying to do is is you know, recognize the corner, probably create some pedestrian opportunities now on this side rather than here. Possibly, uh, you know, enhance this corner and create an outdoor deck. 
and and this gives you a little bit better idea of what that that green space might be like and currently we just don't have it uh especially uh programmed for anything that's part of the development we would expect we would do with staff and with other parties as we move ahead and then finally the view from the north east looking down you can see that north courtyard and the uh yes parking here and the, the suggestion of a parking structure that connects to the brookside or jerry's parking with that um maybe we could ask alex if he'd like to tell us a little bit about the co-op thanks uh brian um thank you uh mr chair and planning uh Commission uh, members, thanks for your time uh, this evening. Um, I'll just spend a little time, the overview uh, by Carrie and Brian um, have been great. Uh, I appreciate that. We could just leave this up as I talk through and talk a little bit about the co-op and our, our model as that might be helpful. And then certainly open uh, for questions at the end. Um, uh, but United Properties, uh, uh, Probably most of you are familiar with us. We've been in business since uh, 1916. We're owned by the uh, Polad family. And uh, my group has uh, specializes in, in senior housing. Um, in this particular location, we're looking at a uh, co-op, senior co-op. We've developed uh, 16 uh, cooperatives in the uh, metro area over the last 17 years. And, um, and all of those have done very well and are full and, and have wait lists. Not unlike um, uh, many of you might be familiar, actually Dinah is the home to the first uh, senior co-op in Minnesota and one of the first in the country, in fact, and that's 7,500 York. It was developed a little over 40 years ago. And, and so that was really, uh, that, that broke the ground on, uh, on senior cooperatives and continues to be a very successful um, community uh, today. Um, but a little bit about senior co-ops and, and kind of how the structure differs from, I, I would say probably the closest comparison would be a, a condo, like an age-restricted uh, condo condominium. And uh, the difference really is, uh, I, I would say there's, there's a couple things. One, it's the ownership structure. Um, you are a member of a corporation in, in a co-op and everyone uh, finances uh, whatever portion of their home is is financed it's financed through a master mortgage instead of an individual mortgage so instead of you going out to a bank and, and getting a mortgage on your individual home um, you deal directly with us it's a hud insured 40-year master mortgage and and so that portion of your home that is financed is through that master mortgage. So essentially all of the members in the co-op have a piece of that uh, master mortgage. Uh, the other really big distinguishing factor is, uh, or are the common areas. You know, in a condo, you typically walk in, there's an elevator lobby and, and perhaps a uh, party room that can be rented uh, for special occasions. Uh, if you walk into one of our co-ops, uh, we have extensive common areas, probably three, four times what you find in a typical uh, condo. And that's all there to uh, encourage uh, a sense of community. And, and it really is successful in, in doing that. And then finally, um, uh, management. I mean, the self-governance, uh, the, the members elect their own board and through uh, that board and professional on-site manager, really are in charge of uh, all their own affairs. So it's a, it's it's really uh, provides a great option for uh, seniors who want to move out of their single family homes and be with um, in an age restricted uh, community um, uh, with uh, other seniors. So a lot different, you know, they're looking for that low maintenance, but they don't want to be in a townhome uh, development. So really it, there's not many options like it. Um, you know, I, we I, looking at the uh, 2020 Dyna Housing Strategy Task Report uh, that I think was undertaken in 2019, and I, I believe completed the the, the next year. Um, there's a number of points raised in that report that 
uh, really a senior co-op aligns with. Uh, that report concluded that 76% of housing demand in Edina over the next five years will be uh, for age-restricted housing. And, um, and specifically, it identified the, the need today for another 360 independent senior housing units. And this, that's very consistent with what we're seeing across the metro and in other cities as well. Um, the demographics of the 70 plus um, uh, segment of the population is, is really exploding over the next 25 years. And, um, you know, this, this type of housing really uh, serves that uh, growing need uh, very well. Uh, it also addresses there was identified in that report a need for alternative life cycle uh, ownership, and um, and that certainly uh, a co-op fits that bill as well. Yeah, what 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 it does essentially, and we like to say it helps keep a city younger, uh, even though you're adding senior housing, is it frees up single-family homes, and so what we found is or are that that residents that grow up in a city or in a specific area, they want to remain in that area. They're not interested in moving out. And so you've got residents who have grown up in Edina, raised families. Uh, they're in a single family home, they're ready to move, but um, they'll really remain in place longer than they typically would um, unless there's a good option. And, and so this type of housing allows them to remain in Edina, free up that single family home and we found that oftentimes it's younger families that come in with school-aged children um, and reinvest in that home, uh, which is, is great for the local school uh, system as well. So what we're proposing here is a five-story co-op, approximately 90 homes. And, and so that, uh, you know, if, if this were a single, if this were a market rate apartment, for example, in this footprint, uh, we could be looking at uh, twice that number, but um, 90 homes, they range in size from a little over 1,200 square feet on up to a little over 1,800 square feet. So the average size is about 1,500 square feet. They're all a minimum of two bedroom, two bath homes, and then they all have a full kitchen because we do, do not provide services. This is strictly independent uh, senior, average age, about 71 is what we find in Applewood. All the parking is underground, uh, so we do not have surface parking. As Brian indicated, the parking for the residents will be off of Arcadia, and then the parking for the um, guests will be up uh, just off of the front entrance, the north entrance, uh, pedestrian entrance, and that'll be um, for guest parking uh, in, in that location. The drop-off for uh, folks will be on the north side uh, as well. It's uh, you know something that always comes up is is uh, is uh, traffic. Anytime we uh, there's going to be a development, people worry about traffic. Uh, it's it's a valid concern, but it's worth noting that uh, senior co-ops are are definitely one of, if not the lowest, traffic generator of a multifamily um, housing option. Uh, we found and, and we typically do a traffic study for just about every new co-op. Uh, we we uh, that study has indicated approximately 3.7 trips per day uh, for a senior, uh, and that compares to a market rate apartment is over seven trips a day, a condo close to six. Uh, the other positive is that the seniors will avoid uh, peak hours, so they're not they're not coming and going during uh, rush hour, and and so just the mere fact that the size of these homes really limit the number. We're talking 90 homes in this footprint. And that avoidance of rush hour uh, is is really a low impact use uh, when it comes to uh, traffic. And then lastly, um, we do anticipate having um, a number a, a 10 percent affordable homes um, in this community. So we haven't uh, we have not it's it's early on. We're still working with with staff to identify what exactly those homes will look like and the price of those homes. But, you know, we do understand that that's an important requirement of the city and we'll be working with the city on that uh, affordability. So with that, I appreciate your time and I'll turn it back over to Dave. I think he's going to give a quick overview of the medical office building and then um, certainly open for additional questions.
Thank you. Thank you, Alex and um, uh, Mr. Chair Commissioners. I'll just uh, quickly wrap up and, and touch on the uh, southern portion of the site, which uh, uh, you see here with the medical office building. Uh, this is about a 40,000 square foot uh, building, as we mentioned, with entry at grade and then two upper levels, full full floor upper levels. Uh, so that first floor, as you see in the illustration here, would really function as a uh, entry drop off roundabout and uh, lobby space, uh, some ancillary spaces to those functions, and then uh, carry uh, patients, uh, guests, uh, staff, and so forth through those upper floors uh, where services uh, would be uh, located. Uh, the, the building would be uh, a building that would be designed to accommodate a, either a single tenant or multiple tenants um, that is uh, yet to be determined. So uh, there's flexibility in the, the de design and the concept of the plan here. But as you see that uh, that parking structure would have uh, on its lower level or under uh, the below grade or below uh, level uh, would have uh, that, that full uh, footprint um, that would uh, reside below and then on the upper level entering off uh, Arcadia would be uh, the upper level, which we say uh, is surface parking, but that's an upper level parking deck. A uh, total of about 166 stalls um, uh, serving the, the uh, building. Um, one of the elements here we think about with this use is uh, how medical and health care and wellness and these services integrate uh, to the economic viability uh, to the Grandview District. So when we think about this in a, in a bigger picture sense, uh, we, we think about the economic and the vitality that uh, the jobs, the activity, the convenience that medical uh, and health and wellness services bring to an area like Grandview that has uh, limited opportunities for economic development and, and that uh, type of activity. So we see this as an, an activating type use. Um, it brings modern healthcare facilities and opportunities to expand. Uh, what's there today? You know, I, I'm, I know people are certainly familiar with the services that are available in Grandview today, but uh, certainly uh, this use would add to the dynamics and, and potential of uh, of these services in the area. So, uh, just with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions ab about the two uh, development uses. And again, to just uh, quickly recap, um, we appreciate these opportunities uh, at these early stages. You know, when when we're developing a concept to uh, your questions, your feedback, your thoughts, and uh, uh, certainly uh, appreciate the, the work thus far with staff. And um, and uh, we'll, we'll look forward to discussion here with the Planning Commission. So, Mr. Chair, thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, do um, any members of the Planning Commission have questions that they or, or they would like to just give feedback? This is a sketch plan review, and it's an opportunity for the Planning Commission to give their feedback to this proposal. Looks like Commissioner Barubi, maybe, uh, do you have, would you like to start us off? Sure. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's exciting to see this um, area potentially get developed. It's been empty for a while and I think everybody's eager to, you know, see some good design. So thank you for this. Um, just a couple things, a, a quick question really first. Um, so you have the residence on the north side and you have the medical building on the south side. The residence is, is taller, um, but the, the way the grade is at that location, you know, it's, it's lower on the south side than it is on the north side, and yet the building is smaller on the south side. So I'm just wondering, walk through your thought process on putting the taller building essentially kind of up on the hill, you know, with a higher elevation. Cause, cause it, it sort of makes the, the taller looking, taller building look even taller. Um, and height is always an issue in Edina. So walk through why you didn't reverse those and put the lower building at the higher elevation. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, thank you, uh, Dave Anderson here, and I, I'm going to uh, have Brian uh, Larson just talk about the arrangement of the site because there's been, you know, certainly from the thinking about this site, uh, there's 
there's logic to this uh, from a planner, designer, and, and, and engineering standpoint. Um, but w one of the things that a two-dimensional drawing never, you know, fully allows you to realize is the, you know, those grades and some of some of those planning challenges. But uh, these uses and um, some of the elements that uh, um, you see here for pedestrian connectivity, how to get an engaging uh, green plaza to incorporate, and and some of those elements of the functionality for the co-ops. And, and what that needed uh, in order to work properly are, are a few of the items. So great issues and the like uh, certainly played into that. Um, but we'll let Brian elaborate on that. And Alex perhaps can speak to some of the operational considerations for the co-ops. Sure, thanks, Steve. Um, it's a good question. We did look at it both ways. Uh, we looked at it, I think every way we could look at it. Um, one of the things, that was sort of a given was this connection along the north side. I mean, that came from, from a long uh, history of planning and, and other development in this area. So we started with that and we looked at different ways of, you know, would, would the medical office building or its parking be pushed up against this? It started to evolve that a courtyard and um, especially uh, the, the senior courtyard, sort of an, a, a pedestrian friendly auto court seemed like a really good uh, kind of combination to, to also work with this pedestrian easement. So that had something to do with it. A lot of it has to do with our, um, our stepping of the site. And we knew we would have more parking needed on, in the senior co-op. And it gave us a lot of site to push this, this level of parking under. And we, we felt from the beginning that a green space somewhere in the middle of the site made the most sense. Um, and that has kind of moved around a little bit, but um, had this been on the lower end, um, it also kind of presses itself as a housing element up against the, the, the Eden Avenue and the, and the rail. And we felt that all things considered, it was a better location for housing up here and um, and it worked well with the auto court and, and the green. Um, I think that's that's most of what yeah I would I would I'm add to call. that if you if you go back to that slide, Brian, uh, that's that's a good one is that uh, we're, we're selling these homes. so essentially these are, are for sale homes and it's important that um, that you give uh, as, as, as good of views uh, to these homes as possible. And right now, sitting up on the high point here, um, really, if you look any direction, you're, you, you have an unencumbered uh, view. It, when you look to the south, you, you've, got the, you've got the green public plaza there and you tend to look over you know, that medical building office building is far enough away that you tend to look over it uh, to the south, or at least you have mm -hmm. certainly a, a large open area. If if you flip those and this this medical office building was sitting down the hill, uh, those views north um, from certainly the the first second, you know, even possibly the third level, if you picture that building sitting down the hill and the medical office building sitting up. They're looking north uh, at the medical office building. You've, you've really, um, uh, I, I think, uh, reduced the quality of, of what they're going to see, which, which certainly could have an impact on, on sales. Right now, um, you're, you're just simply trying to preserve uh, the best uh, views possible on that site. Is 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 uh, is is where we're coming from from a uh, right. housing development standpoint. And, and also, you can see in this section that it allows the sort of expansion of this green space to to and the court to work together facing south as opposed to facing north. Yeah. Um, so it, it seemed like a natural stepping with the site and a natural combination of a semi-private courtyard and a public plaza green. Okay, th thank you for that. If if there's not another question from another commissioner, I do have a few more questions. 
you, Sheila. Okay. So um, I applaud you covering some of the parking, you know, having it underground. Um, there is still that surface lot. Is there, is there a possibility that you can get that underground as well and use that space as a green space so you've got even that much more of a public plaza? So that's, that's the first question. And a follow-up to that, is your intention that the public plaza is truly public or is it really for people who happen to be going to the medical office building or happen to be living in the co-op? Or is it intended, you know, that that would be you know, people who are walking from someplace else might might pass through there or occasionally they'd have, you know, food trucks there, or, you know, different things that you could use that as a public space. So if you can spend some time speaking to both of those, the, the possibility of eliminating that surface parking and expanding that public space, and then what's the thought on the public space? Sure, uh, I can at least talk about uh, the public space maybe first. It's it's intended to be a, a public space and be accessed from um, Arcadia and from the, this uh, sidewalk, but also kind of leaning towards or at least nodding towards future development that will happen as some of these roads get reconfigured, especially um, once we're east of Arcadia. So this is kind of a mid-block um, park that, that is intended to be accessible from future development as well. We tried to do this site uh, configured in a way that there could be a clean property line between the two developments. And so what we see here is, is a, a line that runs here. And um, to get this amount of parking anywhere else, would require starting to slide underneath the building to the north. And so that was part of our, our consideration here. Um, also that parking adjacent to the, um, the railroad is, is a, a decent place for it. Mostly we tried to kind of tuck it away from the most public facing streets. And I think in general with the building, you know, reinforcing the corner and the parking wrapping around and set back from the streets. Uh, though it is uh, on the surface, it, it seems that it um, is at least in a location where it has the least impact in the public walkways. I think if and you if split I, it, if, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, please finish. Yeah. Um, I, I think if you slid it under that, uh, into that, small public area, um, it would probably have an impact on uh, that ability to uh, collect uh, and, and absorb, absorb uh, stormwater. Um, and to your point, uh, Brian, it's, it's critical that these are gonna be owned by two separate entities. And so we're gonna have to get a mortgage, um, you know, for the senior co-op and I think we'd run into uh, some major problems if if the parking were to slide under and be shared in any way or some sort of shared uh, uh, connection uh, between the two could be could be problematic. But it's a good question. Well, if if I read if I read the materials correctly, maybe I should say if I took notes on them correctly. Um, in my notes, I say that you've actually got more residential parking than than needed per the zoning so you've chosen to have more spaces um and actually less than than what would be needed to, for the medical office building and i'm wondering if you can speak to that in your rationale for why you allocated more parking to residential than the zone would call for and and allocated less to the medical I can speak to the residential, uh, the co-op. So we've got the one nice thing about doing, you know, so many of these is we, we really know what, what parking is going to work and what we've been doing at our last several uh, co-ops, and it seems to be working very well, is in that um, kind of 1.7 to 1.8 parking spaces per unit. And, and so regardless of what uh, code might be because um, 
you know, code tries to address generally the use, but um, but we know what has worked for us senior co-op wise and, and that 1.8-ish uh, figure that I believe we have um, under this building is, is, is right where we think we need to be. I, I wouldn't want to be less than that because I think it would uh, end up forcing uh, certainly during uh, heavy usage, usage um, horse cars to be looking for parking elsewhere, which, which can be problematic. Uh, thanks, Alex. And Commissioner, I'll, I'll um, just speak to the medical office parking and, and what you see here um, with the 166 spaces we're, we're showing in the, in the deck. So, you know, your typical medical parking requirements um, by market can uh, exceed these amounts. But one of the principles we followed in our thinking with this, and it speaks to the pedestrian connection to the Brookside ramp, is we see that pedestrian connection being a resource to unlock the potential uh, for that facility to provide parking. And so we think about um, any additional needs we may have for parking for the function of the building uh, being able to utilize uh, Brookside. And so from, from that utilization standpoint, we're comfortable uh, with uh, the parking uh, in the count uh, for the building as this would get further uh, developed and designed. Uh, that we have uh, adequate uh, infrastructure parking access in the area, including what's provided on the site. Um, just just a mention to this as well, and in, in speaking to the green space and the dimensions and size of that, um, Brian may not have mentioned, but it 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 is roughly the size of the Grandview Square Park, just for visualization of, uh, for those who are familiar with that. Um, uh, in in you know, in, in rough um, approximation, but um, when the roundabout, the south uh, lines have been adjusted here, you know, we've had to really work to make sure we have proper setbacks to the south. So we've tried to keep that space as large and flexible as possible. And when it comes to structured parking design, uh, column spacing, geometry, and the like, you know, these these east-west dimensions on a site like this is as tightly configured as it is and some of the variables we're trying to build into the infrastructure modifications occurring along Eden and Arcadia. You know, these have all sort of been developing real time together. So that, you know, is what has gotten us to a plan with uh, some balance um, with the, uh, the, the public space uh, dimensions and parking uh, that work with access through pedestrian connectivity. And as Alec spoke to parking, you know, in the needs of a co-op buyer uh, versus um, a code and uh, our uh, knowledge and, and experience in the needs of a medical office building, um, it, it's, it's, it's addressed through the context of the site and, and why you're seeing the numbers that you are. Thank you. Thank you. Dila, does that, does that take care of your comments for now? It does. I mean, I've, I've got other things I could say, but it's I can't see anybody's face, so I don't know. I don't know who else wants to talk. So I'll I'll pause there and let other people talk. Thank you. Okay, other people, here's your chance to talk. Uh, any other commissioners with questions or comments? I will go. This is great, Commissioner Mr. Bartling. Um, yeah, I have quite a few questions. Um, first of all, my question is, I mean, I, I like the idea of senior housing. Um, what I question, though, is why you are doing all two-bedroom units and uh, at such a large square footage as well. Um, you know, I think that, that one bedrooms or even a thousand square feet is plenty for a single person. Um, and, you know, that also gets it in a more affordable range and reachable to more of our residents. Um, can you answer why your thought, what your thought process is on that? Uh, we have not um, had any interest in one bedroom homes. Um, we've built them before and had problems selling them. Uh, and, and the, the, uh, 
trend just based on demand. What we build um, is really in response to what um, our seniors are asking us to, to build. And that's actually been trending up a, a little bit. It's kind of leveled out. Um, uh, the average has been a little over 1,500 square feet. And, um, and it's just, it's tough to sell the smaller homes. In fact, we back in, in 2008, when the housing market wasn't very strong, uh, we thought just what you were saying, we thought, well, there's gonna be more demand for smaller homes and we built a number of one bedroom homes and and uh, and those were the last to go. In fact, it took us quite a while to sell those. You know, we've had even uh, singles move in saying, geez, I, I just would love that second bedroom for, um, you know, for a, a grandchild or, or, you know, one of my uh, son or daughter to come and spend some time and um, or I turn it into a TV room. And um, that's that's the reason. I mean, it's something mm -hmm. we're constantly revisiting and we could certainly look at, to your point there, we could look at the mix because we do have some smaller two bedrooms that are down in that 1,200 square foot, a little over 1,200 square foot range. Um, so we do offer those sm smaller homes. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can just say from a personal experience, I lived in a 750 square foot two bedroom condo that was awesome and completely comfortable in size. And and so I guess maybe, I, I, under, I do hear you on the two bedroom, um, but you know, even reducing the square footage quite a bit and to make your mark and meet what you need, but also bring down, cause then you maybe get three or, you know, three units instead of two, um, or maybe, you know, I don't know how that works, but something to think about in, yeah. in really reducing square footage because I, and then it's, and then you're able to reach, you know, a price point for more people. That's just one thing to think about. Um, the other thing, uh, comment, I, Again, with the senior housing, um, one thing that I find is very, um, you know, important uh, with, especially with all the generations we have alive now, is that cross generational, um, you know, mix and 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 livelihood. And the one thing I feel is missing from this entire development, and you know, fall, you know, you brought up the the seven the seven. Um, you know, the seven ideas of what the Grand View area wants to, um, you know, how they want to, what the future growth um, is that mixed, like the livelihood and what the residents want. And so I don't, there's no retail. I, you know, the, the courtyard you're talking about, Plaza, there, it, it's a long way before that will ever be used. It feels on unwelcoming and it feels like it's for the residents. Um, I don't think many people would use that at all unless there was somehow something pretty grand or I don't know how that how that's done, but definitely not a lot of work needs to be done with that. Um, and then also just how and I do like the idea of a co-op and having more shared spaces. So there is that community piece. But how do you create that better cross generational mix and a more livelihood? Um, this area right now, I live a few blocks away, so it's dear to me. Um, you know, I think that this needs a lot more livelihood. Um, you know, the hilltop and gets every, I mean, the, there's cars down the street because it's like the only thing going on. Um, and, you know, the coffee shop has a line down the door, uh, out the door, um, because, you know, th that's what, that's the only few things we've got in this whole area. And I know with the medical office building, we've got a ton of medical in this area, um, but it's also starting to feel a little more um, 50th, or not, sorry, 50th. It's starting to feel more like South France um, and very um, suburban, I guess. If And I would like to see, really start seeing this feel more like a neighborhood and building up on that neighborhood and the retail and the and and whatnot and so feeling you know i'd like to see this be like a downtown minneapolis building buildings um versus a monticello building if that makes sense to you guys but um you know just from the perspective of design how the livelihood i mean 50th in france making it feel more pedestrian you know where's the retail and you talk about health and wellness which i'm 100 percent proponent of but this feels like a pretty standard medical office building to me. Um, I'd like to see it more, you know, is it 
individual units that you're enter each one off the street? Does it feel much more, you know, I don't know, you know, like 50 in the France would feel or downtown, you know, um, you know, Grand Avenue, if you want to go that way, I suppose I shouldn't use downtown Minneapolis right now, but, and, you know, an urban and an urban setting more so. And I think that's what really the, the flavor and the ideas of that are here. So maybe, um, oh, and then the other con last comment, and then I'll let you kind of respond to me if you want. Um, I would say to Commissioner Baruby, you know, I, I have no problem with the location of the residents up on the high and the tall buildings. In fact, I, I like the, I like development. I like, you know, whatever, but um, if they will be overlooking the medical office building, I think you'd want to look at a green roof. Um, and you'll be seeing that also from up from the higher area. So green roof or even a usable roof. Um, I don't know how that, how, you know, where that goes or how that fits into development, but that's something I definitely would, um, like to see more thought on with because sustainability is another big piece that I don't see a lot of discussion about here um, as part of those seven, the seven, the seven pieces to grand view, grand area. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Bartling. Other commissioners? I can't see you. Uh, just, you know, hop in. Uh, Commissioner Bennett, Commissioner Miranda. Um, this is Commissioner, Commissioner Agnew. Agnew. Yes. Hello, Commissioner Agnew. Hello. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, you know, I really like to see proposed plans for this space. It's it's really exciting to think about come, you know, what what's gonna be coming into this space. So thank you. Um I I overall kind of echo the real need for more of that green space. And I know that this is a tough area to work with, just given you know the changes to the roundabout and the the side streets and the railway. Like I, I do understand some of the constraints, um, but would love to see more green space. And I think that um, you know we had a really great comment from Commissioner Bartling of how can we bring in more sustainability components of, of green roofs and and maybe build into that. I think one of the original outlines in the one of the plans was leveraging more of that roof space for some of that green area. Um, so I would like to see a little bit more creativity, especially as it, as it comes to the, the green space. Um, overall, I love the inclusion of parking kind of within the building for the most part. Um, that surface lot that is there still, I mean, it does feel a little big, um, but I do appreciate the, again, the constraints of the area and do like um, the amount of parking that you've been able to enclose, especially within the residential area. I think that, that that's really key. Um, so overall, would, would love to see more green space. Um, and I, I think that, you know, Commissioner Bartling really had some really great recommendations. And, and I agree, I would love to see this become more of a, a 50th in France or a Grand Avenue type area um, rather than um, continuing to kind of have more and more medical office building that isn't necessarily as inviting to the overall community. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Agnew. Anyone else? Commissioner yeah, Alcair. Yeah, I wanted to uh, just compliment the team on the design. As others have said, it's very exciting to see something uh, happening in this space. I'm particularly excited about, um, you know, sidewalk access to the north along Arcadia from uh, these new homes. I think that can help uh, develop the retail that's to the north of the site. And probably the most interesting to me is the uh, connection across the railroad track. So I have a a particular kind of specific question about that. In the design, it goes across the track and turns left to get into the into the parking garage. Is there a particular reason why it doesn't turn along the west edge of the site and then just go straight across the track to the garage? I was wondering what caused that. Well, um, I'll try to answer that. This is Brian. Um, the Brookside, okay, first of all, we're, we're set, the height of this pedestrian bridge is set by the, the clearance required at the track. So it's gotta be a certain height. The, mm -hmm. That height uh, does not 
work especially well with any levels that are existing on the Brookside ramp. So we need a little space okay. here in order to do some ramping and connection because we'll come in kind of uh, just below uh, the upper level. So it, okay. it just seemed that following this, this very clean sort of 20 foot easement along the north side, we would simply go straight across. Now, you know, could we zigzag? I, you know, anything is, is possible, but one way or the other, we need, we, we sort of need this just to get, get levels to work correctly. Um, and this okay. will allow, in theory, this hasn't been designed, you know, but this would allow lower levels of the parking ramp, uh, perhaps stairway access to this part, this pedestrian bridge as well, not just the upper level. Okay. In the future, we may see a reason to connect directly across, and this would be a good location for that if we were to uh, see an extension into the parking lots and eventually to the west. Yes, it's just so exciting to have a imagine a way for people to get across that canyon that separates the two parts of the neighborhood. <laughs> and then also a new a new appealing route along the south from your new homes to the library and and the and the that section of the neighborhood too. It looks really it looks really fantastic. Thank you for the presentation today. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bennett, Commissioner Miranda, would you have anything you'd like yes. to share? I'd like to speak. Commissioner me. Miranda. Yeah, I'd like to uh, uh, <clears throat> kind of jump in on a lot of what uh, Commissioner Bartling said. Um, this just, you know, you look at the original Grandview plans and it's very ambitious. And I know we weren't going with the, you know, multi-million dollars city building and whatnot, but um, we've gone from, you know, a, a mixed use uh, pedestrian friendly, bike friendly, you know, amazingly connected neighborhood to what looks like a classic 1970s suburban separated use, uh, you know, with windy sidewalks. Um, <laughs> This is sort of, I mean, the, the good thing is the, I'm fine with the height and the density, and it's great that we have the senior co-op there. You know, the uses are good there, um, but the, just the layout and the, the complete separation of uses, um, I mean, you basically have, to, no matter how many sidewalks you put in, you basically have to drive everywhere. Um, and that, that crossing across the, the bridge you know, that, that's so narrow, um, you know, you couldn't get a cargo bike going across there and a bike going in the other's direction. I mean, it, it's like literally the width of the sidewalk, it looks like. So um, I just find it really, uh, really lacking in everything that really is kind of wanted in the whole Grandview district. So uh, I worked, I was on the Transportation Commission when the Grandview transportation plan was approved. And so my name's on it. And um, I don't really see this addressing that in any significant way. Um, that that crossway there, in fact, it was called Grandview Cross Crossing, I think, um, <clears throat> in the other plans. And, you know, it was a shared street and, you know, cars and bikes and uh, kind of a wooner sort of thing where, um, you know, there wouldn't be a lot of car use, but you'd feel very comfortable walking and biking across there. And it, it's turned into this, you know, very narrow grip. And it's, you know, surrounded by trees. And it just feels so separated from everything else. And you basically got, you know, a driveway next to it. Um, it just, it's just nothing like what I think was envisioned. And um, I just think it really, you know, like I said, the uses are fine, but the, you uh, and as Commissioner Bartling also said, there's there's no, uh, you know, retail or places to eat. Or, and, and I realize retail is a big issue right now, and you know, retail is dying and whatnot, but something, <laughs> you know, we need uh, something to get people to go there. And even that, even the green space, it's like if you don't have a cafe or restaurant or something, I mean, no one's, there's going to be no reason to go there. Um, it's just really... 
I really, this is really missing the mark for me. It just really doesn't seem to uh, do what I think the Grandview plan or the Grandview transportation plan is trying to do. So that's all my comments for now. Thanks. Commissioner Miranda. Commissioner Bennett, I believe you, you're the only one who hasn't spoken. Do you, would you like to share anything further? Yeah, I have maybe one question first and then um, I'd be ready to share some stuff. So I guess for the development team, just understanding a little the history of, you know, when things went quiet on this, and then at the turn of the new year, I guess the only information really any of us have to go off over the public at large is, you know, an article that was posted that the HRA was uh, welcoming to your concept and uh, to go forward with developing that further. I want to just understand some of those, I guess, underlying conversations as to why certain large aspects of the prior project, like a community, indoor and outdoor community aspect has been largely ignored with this one. And uh, is, is that your plan based off of a read of the market and what will work or how much of that is the HRA's direction just so I, I can better adequately respond with a comment after this presentation? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Dave Anderson with Promise You. I, I think I have to uh, defer to Kerry Teague maybe to elaborate on his earlier comments because um, I think what led to this discussion as this plan has evolved and HRA's um, interest in exploring this, um, uh, that backdrop of some considerations relative to the need or use or feasibility of uh, public facilities was a discussion that um, occurred at the, uh, you know, at the, at the uh, council and staff level. So, so Mr. Teague would have to comment on that. But I guess you guys are proposing this to us today without that. So, I mean, obviously that input got to you or you are proposing it separately. I'm just trying to understand how much of a partnership this is. Yeah, I would, jump in. I, I'm not sure that the HRA is unanimous on, you know, the exact direction here. Um, but they were they were comfortable with this plan to at least move forward through through sketch plan and, and see where that takes it, uh, where that takes them. But I don't think there was any guarantee that, you know, this would be the this would be the plan. Sure. Okay, I think that helps at least guide maybe my response. Um, and so I can just spend the next few minutes responding to the, the proposal, that'd be great. So yeah, thank you for your time today. Um, you know, I've, I've also been intimately involved with this site for the last 10 years or so. Basically, it's the reason I'm on the Planning Commission um, as I look back. I moved in close by to this site about three blocks away and you know as soon as the framework was getting developed it was about Grandview I'm like where's Grandview I never heard of it I'm like oh that's where I go to every day with Jerry's um and so being a part of that was just unraveling the potential of this site in particular and if you look through the framework it is glaring that you would be most excited about what happens on this site. And so you can read through all the material and everything. Um, but as I look at this plan and what it encompasses, I, I would, I mean, it's, to be frank, it's a complete and utter disappointment to me. And I feel like it completely misses the mark and the, the intent and the passion and the vision set forth in the framework and then literally everything after that vision Edina, if you follow those concepts, um, if you follow the comp plan, if you follow the transportation plan around this, um, this is supposed to be a very ambitious um, cornerstone signature area in the heart of the Grandview district. And the magnitude and importance of this site and the opportunity for us 
commissioners, us residents, us neighbors is so huge and we have a responsibility to treat it that way. So I, I just don't understand why this proposal and why the direction set forth by some of the HRA would just divert so far and do a U-turn from the plan. So I'm just going to quote a couple of things from the plan just to set the tone of my expectations here. So page 28 as they refer to this area, the Grandview Commons. As for Grandview, the public works site provides a unique and singular opportunity to create a major new public realm amenity that will add interest in the area for all stakeholders, value to real estate, and provide a signature gathering place in the heart of the district. Beyond that, an even greater opportunity exists then to continuously link the businesses and destinations within the district. And you can read everything else. Um, the next page explores potential uses of the commons, right? So social interaction, exercise and fitness, classroom, teen activity, banquet reception, food prep, retail, history, performing and visual arts meetings. I don't see any of that incorporated into this whatsoever. Um, it talks in high detail of having an indoor and outdoor gathering place for the community. Um, the whole vision of the framework is to is hope for change, right? This area has been built around the car. It's a very go-to, they use that phrase a lot, go-to. A lot of go-to uses, and there is a huge void of stay at uses and connection throughout. And this site is, it's the prized possession and especially so because we, the city, we own this. So um, I really urge fellow commissioners um, as well as the council to treat it like that. I mean, think if in a small area like 44th in France, where we know the linchpin to success is that shared parking. What if we owned all that, right? Would we, would we be in this position? I, I just, I just don't understand what's gone awry. And I really expect, um, the next time we see something for this, it to be dramatically different and closer to the last proposal that had a major outdoor amenity, major indoor amenity for the public, um, and especially including um, all ages. Uh, one of the reasons I got involved was like going to the framework development as well as the Grandview Community Advisory Team, as well as the Planning Commission is there's a large age group of mine not represented in these discussions. And when you segment out two thirds of this property to a certain age group, you lose that vitality of all ages that could go and use that site. And yes, they could, but tucking away a public plaza that's in a hidden spot, like no one's gonna use that. So I have way too many things to say that this completely misses the mark. And I'd be happy to discuss further with the city council, who is our HRA, um, or any other commissioners or the development team of my expectations. And I hope that fellow commissioners and residents are passionate and urge for better future. We, we deserve something very innovative, transformative, and this is very safe, suburban and standard. And I will rest there. Thank you. Commissioner Bennett. Anyone else with anything further to say otherwise i have just a few thoughts okay well thank you to the applicants to the city staff that worked on it um for the most part i agree this feels like a uh, suburban development from several decades ago and it's disappointing after waiting for so many years to have something that was really going to be an exciting project for the community the um it, it's hard to tell from the pictures and obviously these are drawings but the buildings you know and you're, you it's obviously a sketch plan but the buildings look kind of generic uh they look like they have extremely long walls which is something we're trying to get away from because that, that, that actually is negative to um pedestrian experience to be you know right up against the long walls um you know i know it's, this has been a challenging site you know, as far as far as one commissioner said, the the the, the density, yeah, that's fine. The height, that's fine. Um, I actually also do. You know, I I share the desire for 
housing diversity, Diana, but I actually am concerned that with this development, even though we think it's a diverse use, I think for this neighborhood, it's a not a diverse use. I, I think this this Grandview area is getting saturated with senior housing, and I'm quite I'm I'm a little concerned about that. There, there, there's a senior housing on the other side of Vernon. There's the Grandview Square, and then we just built the Avador, and pretty soon it's it's just going to be a senior housing neighborhood. And I I don't know if that, that's not really the you know, uh, that's not really a variety of uses when you start getting overpowered in one kind of use. Um, contrary to other commissioners, I'm not a fan of this green space. The reason being is twofold. On uh, one hand, I don't think it's going to get used. I don't think it's going to get used very much. Uh, but what I do think is going to happen, number two, is you're going to pour a lot of water and chemicals on it and... I think we're 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 not quite there, but I think in the not as far away as people think, we're going to start regretting some of these green spaces that we're requiring by buildings that aren't really usable by humans, particularly uh, places that don't you know unless they can unless they can water them with existing stormwater. I think we're going to start worrying that we're just putting stuff in that is just adding more chemicals to the groundwater and, and using precious water that's going to be increasingly precious. So if there's use for the grass, you know, if it's something where you're like, well, yeah, there's going to be regular soccer games or, you know, concerts, it's going to be a regular concert season. And then, then I think it's good. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think that's going to happen here. I think it's just going to be something that's kept attractive for appearance's sake, and people say, "Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's for it's for the environment, green space." But it's good. I think some of these green spaces are going to soon be like plastic recycling, where we're like, we feel good because we're doing it, but we're really actually not helping anything, and sometimes we're actually in the big picture harming things in the world. So, with this green space, I think would fall in that category. So, I, I appreciate the struggles that's been at this space, but I'm with. Commissioner Bennett, I mean, I was really hoping there'd be something that would be be a spark to this neighborhood as opposed to just, um, you know, private property, really, that is duplicative of other older suburban elements. So I thank you for what you've done, but, you know, I'm, I'm just, as I think one other commissioner said, I, I'm, uh, that's my frank feedback. Um, so thank you. And I don't know, I, I, Mr. Mr. Anderson might want to say a few things or ask further questions. No, well, Mr. Chair, I just want to thank you. Appreciate those comments and thank you and, and the other commissioners for your time this evening. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, uh, team appreciates uh, the discussion and, um, we, uh, will continue forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Okay, um, that concludes that item. We have one more sketch plan. Uh, Mr. Larson, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Uh, so, yeah, hi, we have one more sketch plan. Maybe, Ms. Olson, you could figure out the technology. Uh, that's for 4630 France Avenue, I believe. Uh, Planner Teague is going to lead that discussion again. Okay, thank you, Chair. Members of the Commission, in the interest of time, I'll try to move through quick. Uh, so, a uh, much smaller scale project here. So, this is located at uh, 4630 France Avenue, so it's just south of the 44th and France Business District. On the west side of France, there's a aerial shot. Uh, so zoning on the adjacent properties to the north, there's a little fourplex development that comes in off of France. You can see the driveway here, uh, zone PRD2. And there's two single family homes and then further south properties that are zoned R2 for duplexes. Here's a look at the home today. 
existing single family home and to the south, it's difficult to see, but this is that driveway that serves the four unit uh, townhome development. What the applicant was is proposing to do here is tear down that single family home and construct a couple of villa homes. A quick site plan there. And they've provided uh, some architecture <laughs> potentially of, of what the structures uh, could look like. So this request would re uh, require a rezoning from that R1 uh, single dwelling unit district to PRD2, again, similar to the property to the north, and there would be setback and lot area variances. So a setback variance to the north lot line um, of seven feet would be requested. It's generally similar to what the existing single family home is. Uh, to the west, the plans show 25 feet, but I believe that could be adjusted to meet that 35 foot setback. And then a lot area per unit um, variance from 7,300 to 5,000 square feet. So some of the, the issues to touch on here, uh, the density, the, that development to the north, uh, those are just over 5,100 square feet per lot. And this proposal would be just over 5,000. So generally similar, um, um, similar in size. As I mentioned, the structures could be shifted toward France to meet that 35 foot setback. Uh, that could be important to provide some additional screening or buffer from the residential uses to the west. And uh, and I touched on the, the zoning. So I'll stop there and answer any questions that you may have, but the applicant uh, is here as well to um, either make a short presentation or answer questions. Thanks, Planner T. Does anyone have questions for staff or should we go right to the applicant? Oh, yeah, I've changed my... There. It's a better view of me if you unless you why don't we bring the applicant up uh, is, that, is that okay with everyone okay uh, who's here for the applicant carrie uh jeff zebarth i believe is on the call hello mr zebarth uh, yeah good evening and uh thank you for your time i know it's it's late and i'll try to make this quick uh, uh, Mr. Teague, thank you for the uh, explanation of, of what I've uh, been suggesting. And really, I, I want to get an idea of the viability of, of creating two units on this site versus uh, a single family uh, rebuild. The house is being advertised as a as a teardown. Um, it's in sort of dire need of uh, repair. And so um, I looked at an alternative of not a single family, but creating a little bit more density and a little bit more um, diversity of housing um, units in this area, um, something that's different than condominium or uh, townhomes, so therefore uh, smaller uh, villa type homes that would be um, single family homes uh, on this site. Uh, one comment I did want to make is the um, my proposed drawing shows a proposed setback from France of 35 yard, uh, 35 feet and not 40 feet. Um, so I, I believe I can make that 30 feet with the rezoning, um, which would allow more uh, footage on the west side or the rear, um, but still would need a variance on on the uh, on the one uh, aspect of that. And then the other thing I would have a question would be regarding um, if this becomes two lots, um, setbacks from each of the units to those lot lines, um, because the reality of this is it's quite a tight site um, to try to uh, get the two units on there and um, anything that starts to impact uh, that regarding setbacks and so on um, starts to compromise what you might be able to do for the for the living units. The living units are planned around 2,400 square feet, um, sort of a two and a half story um, type of uh, house that would be a main level, an upper level, and then a, sort of an attic. Um, and then the imagery that was shown is Kind of a, I guess, an urban cottage sort of feel to the to the architecture. And with that, I'll just uh, open it up for uh, questions or comments. I'd love to hear your feedback, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Zebra. Do any commissioners have feedback for for these plans, Commissioner Berube? Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, I applaud the um, effort to try and get more villa type housing. Um, you know, I think, I think some people prefer to have their own home versus sharing walls with people in a townhouse or a condominium. 
and um, you know, they want to downsize and there aren't a lot of homes available, you know, villa type. So I, I think that there would be a demand for this. Um, I think it's a good idea to pursue. It, you know, there's been challenges though with people, you know, when you do this in neighborhoods. And so I would think the White Oaks neighborhood, which borders on the backside, um, you know, I think I would look really closely at, you know, the houses on the other side there. And I'm, I'm thinking there's a, a big downward slope. So how you address that with landscaping or other things I think would probably be really important. Um, so I guess that's all to say, I don't know how it would be received by the neighborhood, but I personally, you know, really appreciate the effort to bring in different kinds of housing. Ruby, other commissioners? Commissioner Bennett. I guess I stopped my video. Um, <laughs> no, this in, in, in one, I think most places around Edina, if we saw something like this proposed, we'd be like, no way. Because again, you know, the intent of our comp plan that we just, you know, ushered in is really to focus on the small area plan and not add density to our single family neighborhoods, which is 93% of the population of Edina. So this is different because it's in a location close to our small areas and there, it's already, that, that corridor is already flanked by density above single family homes. Honestly, if you go up that corridor on the west side, the single family homes are actually the, the odd man out or odd person out, whatever's correct now. Uh, so density here and in the way that's proposed is something I, I support. Um, I like the creativity involved too um, and getting density where it matters, you know, along transit lines, et cetera, is where it makes the most sense. So we know we need to fit more people here affordably and this seems like a logical way to do so. So thank you. Bartling. So I have a question. How, so, you know, it's when it's a town home or even they're, when they're connected, even by like, like there's one right on Lake Calhoun that's connected by one foot of like building so that they are falling under a town home so that they're, they were able to build the kind of, it's pretty, it's almost completely separate homes. Um, how is that set for tax base or how is that, you know, because it, you know, if it is this become two lots or does it, you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Does anyone know that? Yeah, I, I could take that. So there's a couple of options here for how it gets platted. So, you know, you could split it in two. So it's two complete separate parcels with easements across them. It could be platted like a townhome plat where um, there's a, the property lines are essentially the walls of the building and then the outside becomes shares, shared space and there's a maintenance agreement between the two. So those are some of the things that we'd need to work out before a, any formal application would be made. Um, but there's some options here for, for how it gets platted into two lots. Okay. Um, well, knowing that, I, I actually um, enjoy the designs um, and I think, you know, they're fresh and not your typical cookie cutter stuff. So I do like that and, and the urban feel of them. Um, and I like the roof decks versus, you know, having it on the ground and pr provides, you know, that different, um, something different. What I do question though, um, is why it needs to be 5,000 square feet. I mean, that's, those are huge homes. And so when we're talking about setbacks, I think that's the struggle I have when you're already pushing the boundaries, um, not hitting those setbacks when you don't really have to have it be 5,000 square feet. If you, cause you're, you know, your, your argument was, you know, for downsizing or, or maybe, maybe that was commissioner Baruby that said that, but, um, you know, that's just something for, you know, for my, for my thoughts. I thought the point was at 2,400 square feet each. Did I miss that? Oh, is it 24 each and five total? 
Uh, yeah, correct. It's 2,400 square foot each unit. Oh, so yeah, that's great. Perfect. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's much better. I like it. But yeah, the setback piece, though, I do see that how you could probably fit that on and you wouldn't have to split their driveways and you could make those work. So I would be, it, the side setback would be the one to talk about, but the back and front, I think I would be more of trying to make that work as a setback. But I do really like the idea of it and and agree with Commissioner Bennett on anywhere else, no, but in, you know, if in this area or down on 62 in France where there's all the duplexes and that, that kind of dense regions already, I'm all for that. Commissioner Bartley, anyone else? I, I, I have one, one follow-up question. Um, we didn't really talk about price points, right? What, what would be your thought on where these would, where would you aim to sell these? Uh, that's a really good question. I would say um, slightly over a, a million dollars. Um, and that's part of the cost model understanding of the, the properties being advertised for $400,000. And so you start to do the cost model and constru construction costs. Um, but I'd want it to be competitive. I know there's a townhome project that I think is just uh, pending sale that is very comparable in size. Um, that's two blocks away, and those were being sold at uh, 1.2 million. So, um, hopefully, a little less than that, so they'd be competitive in the area. Did you want to put your name on one? <laughs> they're, I think they're interesting, but it wouldn't be ready today. But I, it's interesting to know the price point. So, thank you. Yep. Sir Miranda, Lou, do you have any questions? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, um, thank you, uh, Chair Nemiroff. Um, yeah, as other commissioner said, it's great that we're increasing density along France Avenue. It's a major county road. Um, I mean, if anything, a duplex is a pretty minor increase in density. Um, but with a single lot, you know, there's not much you can do. But um, so the major question I have is, um, um, granted, these are million-dollar houses, but um, have you considered going one or both of these with a single car garage. I mean, I, I have friends post COVID-19 who are now gonna be working from home either all the time or most of the time. Seems like um, that will become more common and um, households aren't gonna just like give up their cars, but they could go down by a car and maybe by, maybe you're thinking you've gone from three to two and that's what you're gonna go for. but. Um, also, as I think Commissioner Bennett mentioned, somebody did, um, the, there's going to be bus rapid transit. The sixth line is going to be e ABRT. Uh, it's going to be called the E-Line. E um, it's going to run from Southdale to uh, downtown and to the U of M. Um, it's going to be almost like LRT. I mean, it's going to be a great, fast, convenient system. So people could even work downtown or at the U and, and take the bus back and forth every day. Um, again, just an ability to go down by a car, not so much go car free or anything. And then it's a very walkable neighborhood. I mean, you're just steps from 44th in France, uh, 50th in France is just south of there, Linden Hills just east. Um, you know, I just think it's something you uh, you ought to consider if you haven't. Well, thank you. Thank you. And then uh, Commissioner Zagnor or Al Cairo, have not either of you like to share any thoughts? Okay, Mr. Commissioner Alcair. Commissioner Agnew, do you have I anything? Have, I don't have anything to add. No, nothing to add. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bennett? I just want to clarify. I think I said affordable. I retract that. <laughs> um, so I'd like, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, a few, few final comments. Uh, I like the concept. I like the location. Um, I, I think that uh, Commissioner Miranda's suggestion regarding uh, a two car garage or one going to a one car garage is definitely worth thinking about because it would allow you to have, it's a great location to have a you know lower, lower car living and it would allow more livable space or more, 
patio space or something, but you know, whatever, whatever you give up with the car because it's located so close to, um, other, you know, uh, so many other things, including transit, including stores that are walkable, uh, that that's more living space for people. And, and I know that's not really how people are thinking today, but I think more people are going to be thinking that way. I'm with, I'm with Lou on that. So, but otherwise, I think this is really nice. I think it's attractive, and I, I appreciate you bringing it forward and, and hope to see you back. Okay, thank you very much for your time. I know it's late, and uh, very great, uh, very good comments. Thanks for the input. Thank you, Mr. Zebarth. Well, everyone, thank you for all your work tonight. We, we have gone through a lot of things, and it is a late evening. Um, next, we have chair and member comments. Do any members have comments? Uh, I, I just have one, and that is um, we're going to have a work session in two weeks at 5.30. One of the things I hope to go over are some of the feedback you gave to our three questions. You know, uh, you know, one thing you like us to do more of, one thing you like us to do better of, and, you know, one thing you like to see us do. Um, gotten some good feedback. If you have any, anyone else's any feedback, just send it, send it along to me or to me and Carrie and, We'll compile them and discuss them in two weeks. And we'll also, before that meeting, uh, there may be other things on the agenda. We may, that may not take up that much time. You know, we'll see. We, we, there are other things we want to talk about because at, at the very least we can talk about uh, future work session meetings. Of course, we're going to have a public hearing, I believe, at our next meeting for parking. And that may come back to us, too. Um, we're always getting new thoughts. Anyone else? Anything? Any other further thoughts? Commissioner city Miranda? View. Yeah. Uh, just a quick thing that uh, the city is launching a climate action plan uh, committee, and uh, I've been appointed to that. So that's going to be starting next week. So I'm on the, uh, oddly enough, I'm on the land use and uh, transportation subgroup <laughs> and a couple other subgroups. So, um, so I look forward to that. Congratulations. I'm glad to hear that you're on it. Anyone else? Uh, staff comments? Uh, just, just quickly, uh, there's no uh, no council actions to report on. We didn't have anything from Planning Commission on the last council agenda. But uh, next week, we, we will have a public hearing for the Perkins site, Kitty Corner from City Hall. Um, so expect another large agenda. That's it Thanks, for me. Carrie. Thanks. Okay. Final opportunity. Can I get a motion for adjournment? I'll move to adjourn. I second. <laughs> Liz, you're still on. Can you do a roll vote, please? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Elkire? Aye. Commissioner Bennett? Aye. Commissioner Barubi? Aye. Commissioner Agnew? Aye. Commissioner Miranda? Aye. Commissioner Bartling? Aye. Chair Nemirov? Aye. Thank you and good night, everyone.